everyone. Hot mic. Good afternoon. My name is Kyle, and my colleague Louis here will introduce ourselves more formally in a moment. But we are both from Gradle. Uh, we are both Gradle build tool engineers, and we're going to talk about give your build some love, and it'll love you back. Today's agenda, we're going to talk about what is Gradle. I'm sure we, I hope we have a lot of Gradle users. Who uses Gradle today? Oh my gosh, amazing. Thank you. Um, we'll do a little bit of an overview. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the JVM specific features for building JVM projects, Java projects. We'll do a, a deep dive on build logic, uh, sorting and organizing some reusable components of your build. We'll talk about how you can structure your builds. Uh, we'll focus on some things you can do to improve the performance of your builds, including uh, a cool new feature we're working on called the configuration cache. And then finally, uh, we'll share a little bit more about our future roadmap. So who, who are these two guys up here talking to you? Hi, everyone. My name is Kyle Moore. I'm a principal engineer with the Gradle Build Tool. Um, if you can't tell by my voice, I'm a... I'm a Yank. I'm based in California. Uh, I was previously owning uh, all of the build uh, infrastructure at LinkedIn, where we had uh, 12,000 different repositories I was in charge of. Prior to that, uh, Guidewire Software, where I was a committer, uh, maintainer of the Gosu language at Gosu, um, gosuling.org. And you can see my, my socials here. And here's Louis. Okay, Louis Jacomet. So I've, I've been working at Gradle since 2018. Um, I'm currently the support team lead. So we actually the people that look at your issues when you file them against Gradle and try to categorize and ask you more information uh, when relevant. Um, before that, I've done dependency management, some of the GVM plugins features. Um, and even before that, I was at Trakota working on EH cache, so caching and distributed systems. Um, and I guess my main issue in life has been to not fully figuring out how to stay out of management. So I'm again leading a team now. It's unavoidable. Yeah. So a bit about Gradle, because I mean, Gradle is a nice build tool, but it's also um, a company that allows us to be here to talk to you today. Um, so Gradle itself, since 2008, really the goal is to improve developer productivity. So make developers more productive by having a tool that tries to get out of the way. Um, the build tool is effectively an Apache project, uh, Apache licensed project. Um, a couple of years back, it was mentioned as one of the top 20 uh, popular open source projects. And nowadays, we reach around 30 million downloads monthly. Um, these numbers have to be taken with a grain of salt because ephemeral CI um, has hit the like, ecosystem pretty widely. And so that means potentially, if you use the Gradle wrapper, you get downloads every CI run. If you do that, though, you need to fix your build because you're waiting for download time. <laughs> um, behind the build tool, there is actually a company that makes money and allows us to work on the build tool, but also um, allow uh, larger companies to install Gradle Enterprise, which is a commercial solution. Um, and the goal is to provide developer productivity engineering. So really a way to measure the performance and what happens during a build and at the scale of an organization, try to optimize that so that developers have more time for features. Um, this is kind of something that we try to um, announce to the ecosystem or like push forward is this whole developer productivity engineering. And so it's the aspect that your development practices um, can be improved mostly through engineering practices. So measuring, testing, improving, um, and then uh, not regressing. Um, and so the goal is like make builds and testing faster, but also solving issues, solving build issues. Why does it work on my colleague's machine and not on mine? One of the main tools we have for that is build scans. Uh, build scans are effectively a permanent record of everything that happened during your build. Um, test results, but also um, how the actions were executed, in which order, um, what was the local environment when that happened, so that uh, you can probably figure out quickly that your colleague is actually running Java 17 and not the recommended Java uh, 19 on his machine or things like that. Um, and so if you want to know more, um, you can flash that QR code. We have a speed challenge where you use your own build, um, you try to improve it, and if you can show progress from an old build to a more recent build, uh, we'll send you some uh, swag um, as, a, as a way to thank you for your time. 
And maybe last on Gradle, we're hiring. So if anything we say today sounds really interesting and cool, do apply, again, flash the QR code, um, and or come talk to us at the end. So that was it for like the setup, right? What's Gradle? Who knows what Gradle is? Yeah, okay, a few hands. Come on, there, there were lots of Gradle users. <laughs> Nobody knows okay. what it is. So it's actually a tool to automate building software. So at the core of it, you have an extensible configuration model, dependency resolution, and then execution engine. And really, that's the core of Gradle. Based on that, we build plugins for ecosystems. And Gradle has its set of core plugins, so you will be able to build Java, Groovy, Scala code from core Gradle plugins. Um, you will be able to interact with tools like Chestyle or Jacoco to get some code analysis, um, running tests. All of that comes bundled as part of Gradle, but also there is a quite extensive community of plugins, like we're around 6,000 uh, community plugin nowadays on the plugin portal. There may be more plugins, like the Android plugins are not on the Gradle plugin portal, for example. Um, and so you can have like other ecosystems. Android is a big user. The whole Kotlin ecosystem uh, is on board Gradle. Uh, Noki is a series of native development plugins. Um, you've got plugins from Spring, from Micronode, to do Node.js, to do ASCII Doctor. I mean, this Gradle presentation is actually an ASCII Doctor reveal JS presentation built by Gradle. Um, so many, many, many options. How do you use it? Well, the first thing you come in contact with normally is the Gradle wrapper. Um, and so what Gradle requires is a JVM, but from there, it will uh, launch a script that will verify whether or not you have the right Gradle version locally for building the project you're looking at. So encoding the Gradle version into the project is an important part of the Gradle ecosystem because it allows us Gradle developers to evolve the Gradle APIs more easily because we know that you can pin your project to a Gradle version and the build engineer or the part-time build engineer on your team can decide to do the upgrades whenever time permits. You, there is also a way to bootstrap a uh, uh, project. So there is a quite old now Gradle initializer, or there is, if you have a local Gradle version, there is an init task that allows you to bootstrap different setups. Um, and since a few versions, it also now has a um, incubating mode, where it will effectively opt you in some of the incubating features of Gradle, so putting you a bit on the bleeding edge. Then after that, as a developer, normally you interact with Gradle mostly through the ID, but you can also interact with it uh, on the command line. And so that's mostly for folks looking at the presentation afterward, but you'll have links to the doc for the CLI, the wrapper, um, and also the um, ID usage. So what do we mean by extensible configuration? Well, if you look at the block of code up there, we see that we apply a plugin Java to our project. When I do that, this Java block below is actually dynamically added to the DSL. And it allows me to do things like, I want my uh, sources to be jarred as part of my project execution. So this works through a plugin system, which has the ability to effectively extend the DSL. Um, however, the end goal, and it's often a critic that you see on, on Gradle builds, the end goal is that you should model your build, so tell Gradle what to do, but not how to do it. And so ideally, your build script is mostly declarative, and everything that's imperative, because you have some specifics inside your organization, you move into a plugin. And we'll see later that um, the cost of creating a plugin in Gradle is actually pretty low, and so should really be the way of moving forward. So the other thing that an ecosystem or a set of plugins does is it models the different actions of your project. And so that's the graph you see there below the, the code snippet, where we have this concept of an assemble task. What is assemble? Well, it just makes sure that all the binaries of your project are constructed. And so in order to do that, it may need to run the jar task. It may need to run some uh, source jar, since we configured it above. Um, and in order to do jar task, well, we better compile the code and things like that. And that's effectively what we mean by um, dependency resolution for tasks in Gradle is that when you invoke a Gradle command, you start with an entry point. I want to run my tests. What does that mean? When in order to run your tests, I managed to pause the presentation. Sorry about that. Fat fingers, I guess. Um, when you uh, request this test, 
the test task, because of the conventions of the Java plugins, knows that it needs the classes of your production source. In order to get those classes, it has to compile the Java code. Uh, but it also better produce the test classes. So it knows also that it needs to compile the test classes, and it may need another few tasks, like, for example, processing resources or things like that. But we could say that's what happens like inside the given project. But of course, you could have dependencies to a different project. In the naming of Gradle, because it's a slightly different uh, naming in Maven, in the naming of Gradle, we talk about a build, and a build has multiple sub-projects. So when I use projects, it's in that context. So it still is a single build. And so, for example, when I want to compile Java, I actually need to resolve that compile class path, which is there. This time, it's no longer task dependency resolution, but it's external dependency resolution. And through that compile class path resolution, I may discover that my utils project is actually part of the dependencies of the project I'm testing. And so it means suddenly that I need to add one more execution to my task graph, or even more than that, in order to compile the Java code of that project. And so that's how, when you invoke Gradle, we build a graph of everything that needs to be done. And so, for example, the right way of running something in Gradle but without running the test is actually figuring out which task you need or customizing your build so that you have that invocation readily available for developers. So normally, you can also exclude tasks, but that's usually a, a smell. Then each unit of work. Um, should do something that has not been done before. And so there are different layers in Gradle that, help, that helps with that. Um, so the first thing we do is we'll check, did the inputs of the task change? Well, if they did not change, maybe we look at the outputs. And these outputs, did they change? No? Well, perfect. The task is up to date, nothing to do. If any of the inputs or the outputs changed, well, there we're going to start looking into the Gradle uh, cache. And so here it's the ability to actually say, you know what? I know what the inputs are. I've never run that for this particular checkout of the project, but maybe it's been run elsewhere. And we've got two variants of the cache. One is local, so it means you may have run that same task in a different branch, but you've s since then switched, and we'll find a result and we'll just grab those. Or it may actually that your CI system has been populating the remote cache. And when you run locally, we realize that the remote cache has an entry for the task you're trying to run. And instead of running that task, we will grab the results from the remote cache and um, expand them locally. And then, of course, if all of that fails, well, we have work to do. And so we will execute the code of the task with potentially two outputs. I mean, success, which is the desired outcome, or failure, if you have like test failures, or compilation failures, or that kind of things. So, as a reminder, what we have in Gradle is a tool that automates building software with an extensible configuration model, a dependency resolution engine, and a task execution engine. So that's effectively our first chapter on what is Gradle. Um, and what we'll try to do today is like, give you the opportunity to ask questions at the end of each chapter so that we can like, have some context for the questions. And as a motivation, we have a few t-shirts here, which will be ask a question, get a t-shirt after the talk. So any question at that stage? And not can I get a t-shirt, <laughs> right? <laughs> OK. Shall we move on? Please. So um, <coughs> let's talk a little bit about the specifics of Gradle in terms of modeling the JVM ecosystem. Um, the first thing uh, we're going to look at, fine, we're going to look at a few things. Uh, the first thing is version catalogs. Who has heard about version catalogs? Huh, on Great, that's going to be useful for the rest of you. Um, who's using version catalogs? Ah, about the same amount of hands, OK. Um, tool chains? Who's heard about tool chains? OK, and who's using tool chains? Ah, damn, so, folks, you're in the right room. Yep. <laughs> test suites would be the next. Let's say again, test suites. OK, a couple mm -hmm. as well. Good. Awesome. Test fixtures? 
Oh, it's a bit older and a bit more hands, so that's work. that works. Um, and who's done publication? Yes, that's a bit more hands, which is expected. Who's suffered with publication? Yes, you are in the right room. Like, we will try to answer some of these questions for you, or like, um, advertise some of the features. Um, I realize we probably missed a switch, yep. because I've been talking a lot. Do you okay. want to do the version catalog stuff? No. No? <laughs> so, version catalogs. The uh, one, one thing that we see, and because of the DSL um, aspect of Gradle, sometimes build can effectively be quite complex, and some developers don't feel at ease um, editing or entering in the build logic by fear of breaking something or doing bad stuff. At the same time, as an engineer, upgrading a dependency or adding more dependency is something that you often have to do, and there shouldn't be any link on breaking a build and adding or upgrading a dependency. You might break your compilation, your test, and all of that, but these are effectively your work. But it should not impact the build logic itself. And so one thing that we've done um, and we've introduced in the, the 6x line, and I think made stable somewhere in the 7x line of Gradle, is version catalogs. And you can see the example here above of the TOML format that you can have for version catalogs. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to declare what your build is going to use as versions, dependency coordinates, plugin coordinates in your build. And you declare those in a very basic format. So the TOML format, for those who don't know, is effectively some um, improvement over a property format. So all of, all of what we have here could be exploded into very long property names um, with values at the end. And just TOML allows you to create sections so that you have a bit of um, a better um, um, readability. But so we'll start here, for example, we've got like groovy versions at the top. Then we've got what we call the lang version. We'll see why uh, in its usage. But we can already see that it's not just a simple version, but it's actually one of the Gradle rich version. So we say that we strictly need some of the 3x versions. And if nobody has an opinion, we should use 3.9. Then you've got libraries, so here we can see that we've got some groovies and common slang, hence the lang uh, version name, which all refer to these versions so that we don't have to redeclare them again. We also do a bundle, and a bundle here is that we take groovy and we say that this is uh, an alias for both groovy core and groovy JSON. Um, the alias here reuses modules that are in the same um, Maven uh, coordinates, if you want. But the bundle is absolutely not limited in that way. The bundle for you could be your integration test libraries. And it could use all kind of libraries that you know most of your integration tests will be using. So that, that's also something you can do in the bundling. And then the last one um, is a way to refer to, um, to plugins. And so here, instead of having um, a group and an artifact, you, have, you just have the plugin ID and still have a version. Similarly, the version could be extracted into the version category at the top. And one of the benefits of version catalogs is, as you can see the usage below, when you use the dependencies block of a project, you no longer use strings. You actually have generated accessors for both the Groovy and the Kotlin DSL, which give you some code completion in your IDE and allow you to refactor those properties if needed. And if you remove a line from the version catalog, your build will fail because the matching accessor will stop being generated. So I've said a number of these things. Um, maybe the, the points to highlight is that version catalog is really about expressing an intent on the uh, dependencies you want to use. It is not about specializing these dependencies in their different contexts. So you can't use classifiers. You can't use exclusions at the level of the version catalog because all of these have a meaning actually where the dependency is consumed. So the accessors are typed, uh, the bundle, and um, the match for the TOML is actually an API um, in the Gradle uh, settings file, which allows you to do uh, things like um, declaring extra catalog than the default one, um, and also importing catalogs from uh, published uh, catalogs on Maven repositories. I uh, think another point I'd make is, if you could see our internal document, uh, how we ended up on the TOML format, 
uh, it was a it was a holy war of of epic proportions, right? Why not XML? Why not this? And and we chose Toml for reasons I won't go into today, but with this API Louis mentioned, if you want to use JSON, you can do that, right? And then using our API, you could load the file from disk and then parse it, you know, whatever structure you yeah. you see fit. So there are a few things that are worth mentioning as well for the um, version catalog. Um, Gradle has a complex dependency resolution engine for third-party libraries. Um, and so what you declare in the catalog is just like the rest. It's information. Unless you use strict versions from the rich version options or stuff like that, it is just another source of dependency information, meaning it will get conflict resolved and you may still get a different result than what you declared. Um, one thing that we're looking uh, we're thinking about for future versions is potentially the ability, just like you have um, in Gradle, the ability to say fail on version conflict or fail on dynamic versions. Uh, we may want at some point to have something that says fail on divergence from the version catalog. Um, obviously, the method will not be named that way, but that gives you an intent. Um, and so that would allow you then to trust the catalog, not only as a source of information, but also as some, some source of truth. So as I've said, you can publish and import catalogs. And we have a few limitations that mostly come from the fact that we have an API in settings. Because we have an API in settings, using the catalog for your init scripts or settings plugins um, is a egg and chicken problem. Like you're too early in the life cycle to actually have loaded the catalog, and so you can't use it there. Was that clear for those who didn't hear about catalogs? Can I maybe share the use case for this? At, for example, at LinkedIn. Oh, we have a question. Have yes. A question. Yeah. It's kind of similar to Form in the end, right? What's different? Um, no, I mean, I think the build script is more similar to the POM because the, 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 the POM of uh, Maven effectively contains all the information about your build logic, again, unless you publish or clean the POM for everything. Um, it, it's more like, yeah, it's really the, a catalog of version. And then as a developer, um, you could also view, for example, the catalog as a way to enforce in your organization that developers only use versions from the catalog. You could disallow the, the other notations and make sure that they get stuff from the catalog. As a, uh, um, as a co-worker on the project, it's easy to review because dependencies added will be seen in the catalog and things like that. So it, it can serve as that as well. Yes, another question? Yeah. What would be the best way to find out where your version actually So the question is, what would be the best way to find out where your resolved version comes from? So we've got a couple of things. Uh, build scans will tell you. Um, if you can't use build scans for whatever reason, like even the free, uh, the freemium version, um, we have a task that's called um, dependency insight. Mm -hmm. And if you point, Dependency Insight, it's documented uh, but um, on, on in the documentation. If you point it at a configuration inside a project and ask it about a specific uh, dependency, uh, which can be um, by its group artifact name or even uh, some part of it, um, it will tell you all the things that participated in the resolution, and it should show you why something won. And it will give you also all the elements in the trees. Um, so that, that would be the best way, yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, the version catalogs only influence the top level dependencies or also transfer dependencies? Uh, the question is does the version catalog only influence top level or first order dependencies or the transitives as well? It's a very good question. So the version catalog itself influences neither because it's just a catalog. In order to get the influence, you actually need to use the declaration. When you use the declaration, if you declare it that way, then it's obviously that it's a first level dependency. Um, as I've said, it's not really the topic today, so I won't go too much into detail, but Gradle will potentially upgrade common slang to another version than 3.9, or even actually it could resolve 3.5, because the prefer is very um, um, light in terms of opinion. Mm -hmm. However, because you have a strictly 3.8.4, no, sorry, so 3.5 is wrong. Sorry, it could resolve 3.8. However, because you have a 3.8.4 as a range, if something else in the graph tries to bump the version to 4.0 or 4.1, or 
or tries to downgrade it to 3.7 or something, you'll get a build failure. So here you have something that is strict. I can't go outside of that scope. Now, a version catalog entry can be used as well in a constraints block. And so you can, you can then say, if somewhere in my graph I require groovy core, then I would like to constrain it to 401. But if your graph doesn't require groovy 4, then this will not show up. I think let me uh, also like clarify the use case we had on this yep. at LinkedIn with, I mentioned 12,000 repositories. The way a build script, uh, the way you configure them today for Gradle users, you know, when you say I have a implementation configuration and then I provided a string, which is the Maven group artifact version, Trinity or coordinates, right? That's a, basically you're passing a string argument to a Java method in the background. And so when you or a user you support needs to go edit a build script directly, they're, they're, they're messing with code more or less. The power of the version catalog is extracting that reference to a separate place that you can, um, it, it, it's easier to edit at scale. Right, so if you if you had thousands of repositories like I used to manage, it's much easier to go to a, a somewhat known format like a TOML file, or the flexibility of using something else like XML or or JSON uh, to go through and programmatically edit this across potentially hundreds or thousands of code repos. Yep. Yes. Uh, the question is whether catalogs can be composed and combined with other ones or extended and modified. Uh, I think extended, no, but you can you can import multiple catalogs and reference them with a different namespace. I think we have a demo later that'll show this. Yeah, but I'll, I'll show something. Uh, but initially it was possible to import multiple catalogs into a single catalog. Um, and it created just way too complicated APIs or failure modes because which one do you choose in terms of things? So right now, you can only import one catalog, but you can actually overload some of the definitions. So there are ways to do some things, yeah. Okay, let's move on to um, our Java toolchains and we'll quickly go over some of the, of the code of catalogs in, in the demo we have for toolchains. So Java toolchains, um, I mean, it's effectively something that um, uh, Maven had for a while um, and was missing in Gradle. Um, and it's that ability to complete, fun to separate the JVM running your build tool from the JVM you need to compile and test. Um, and th the, the reason we want to do that is that maybe at some point we finally get to a place where all of the plugins, all of the core plugins, and also the community plugins support that way of working. And then one day, then Gradle can be shipped with a JVM. And unless you've got special needs, you no longer have to think about what runs Gradle. Um, Right now, it applies mostly to compilation, test, and execution. Um, and uh, the selection criteria um, are, for the moment, uh, somewhat limited. So you can select on the Java language version and on the JVM vendor. Um, we also have that implementation field, which allows you to select J9 implementations. But it might end up being um, deprecated because it was mostly useful in the context of Adoptium, of, sorry, Adopt OpenJDK which would bundle both regular JVMs and J9 JVMs, or hotspot JVMs and J9 JVMs um, under the same vendor. Um, and that's no longer the case uh, nowadays. So I think with toolchains, um, le let's go with seeing some code and doing a demo. And let's see if the screen switching worked as well, far works as well as during the rehearsals. So that's the settings file of my small demo project. Um, the one thing it illustrates is going back to the version catalogs is the fact that by declaring a repository in my dependency resolution management section, I'm able to create a Micronaut Leaps catalog, which imports the Micronaut bomb um, and makes it then available as Micronaut Leaps dot. And then everything the Micronaut team um, declares in their catalog becomes available in your build, and so you can use that as your source of dependency versions. 
So if I switch to my uh, build.gradle, um, I can see, for example, here, I've decided that I will use the lockback version of Micronote um, for my runtime uh, dependencies. So here I see also an example of using my default catalog, which this time is just my TOML file. So that's in the Gradle libs.versions.toml. So that's a convention name. Um, if you place a TOML file, name that at that location, Gradle will automatically load it without you having to do anything in the settings. Um, and here I had the Spotbox plugin declared, um, and so I'm allowed to use it. As you can see, um, some of the ID support still needs to uh, move forward because it highlights it as an error, but um, actually uh, my project works just, just fine. So if I list my tasks, I mean, the output doesn't matter. It's just showing you that there is actually no breakage. So that's a, a bit of an unfortunate uh, user feedback that needs to, to evolve. So the way tool chains work is effectively I have my Java block which, let me hide that guy and that guy as well, which comes from the fact that I applied the Java library plugin. Um, and by having the Java block um, and using the Kotlin DSL, I immediately get also the type um, in that block. So if I want to look at APIs, Javadoc, or, or DSL documentation on the, on the Gradle documentation, um, I can see that uh, pretty easily um, as a tool chain block. And so again, since I'm in a static language, oh, there we go, um, I have the ability to uh, use autocomplete to get through the different things. And so here, what I have now is a toolchain spec on which I can declare that I'm actually planning to use Java 17 in my project. Now, what I've done here is leveraging the convention model of Gradle because I've set that toolchain definition at the Java extension level. And it means that in my project, my compile task, my test task, and if I was in an application project and not a Java library project, my uh, Java execution task will all use this language version um, for, for their action. Of course, I may have specific needs. And so I could say that in the context of the test task, um, I actually want to configure the launcher for the test task. And so here, what I need to do is I need to set my launcher. And what Gradle provides me is a Java toolchain service. And on that Java toolchain service, I can ask for a launcher. And here, I'm again in the context of this Java toolchain spec. So I can do exactly the same. Um, I can set my language version. And here, for example, I can say that I actually want 18. And so what's going to happen is that even though I've set 17 for everything, I'm still going to run the test with 18. If I do that, what happens? This is a trick question. <laughs> so the build breaks, but why? Yep. Exactly, because the test JVM cannot run the bytecode. You've compiled to Java 17, you're trying to run with 11, you'll get the classical errors that you see in Java when you've got this kind of bytecode mismatch. It will tell you that it doesn't know, it doesn't know bytecode, like the bytecode is too recent for the 11 VM to read it. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we have with tool chains is um, Gradle knows a bit about all the, uh, the all, all the Java tool chains that you've got locally on your machine. Um, and we'll go uh, through the slides a bit of the different reasons it knows that. But there is like a Java tool chains task. And as you can see in Gradle, I can always invoke the task with a shorter name, as long as the shorter name does not conflict. Um, and so probably in that context, JT should have worked. But no, it won't because Java test compile but JTO would. Um, and here what I get is I can already see that my project and has a lot, my machine has a lot of Java installed. And so all of these would be available. And not only do I have the, the, the language version and the vendor, but as you can see, we actually probe for more information. 
And so that would be also an evolution for the future. We should allow you to actually select based on that um, extra information. That's what I had for the tool change demo. So I hope you can see the, the oh, I have a question way in the back. Yes. Okay, so the question is, is there a difference between setting source and target flags versus using the tool chain? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. So the, there are many flags that you can use um, in Java. Um, you have the source, source compatibility, target compatibility, as they're exposed in the Gradle DSL. If you use that, the only thing you're actually um, um, limiting is the bytecode level that's produced. But so if I use an 11 JVM and I say source target um, 8, then I will still be able to use APIs introduced in 9, 10, and 11. Um, then there is another flag, the release flag, which still allows you to run 11. But when you say release 8, you not only constrain the bytecode, but you also constrain the APIs. So it will fail if you try to use one of the um, added APIs because it effectively messes up uh, what's visible on the boot class path. With tool chains, you kind of don't even have to ask about that because you're effectively running with a JVM that has the language version you specified. So you, you, you are really running with 11. So if your build is running with 17 and you say tool chain 11, then we actually fork the compilation, the test execution, and we start them with a 17, enfin, which direction was I in? 17 to 11, we yeah. start them with 11. Now, to be clear, you can combine those. You may want to encode the toolchain in your build so that nobody in your organization can mess up the bytecode that's produced, um, but you may also still have the need of doing funky stuff. I mean, the entry points of Gradle, the build tool, are still nice if you try to run Gradle with Java 6 or 7 in the sense that we will give you a nice message saying this is not supported, mm -hmm. instead of the stack trace and the error about the bytecode level. In order to do that, what we do is we compile with 11, we target six for these sub-modules, but we just do the source target, because we know that after a short code path, we will be using eight APIs, but that's not a problem, because if you reach this code path, we know you're using eight. And so there are, there are use cases for having all of these options. Honestly, nowadays, if you don't have such use cases, go with tool chains. That's the safest. So like I said, how does Gradle know about Java? Well, a, different, a number of auto-detected defaults, operating system, package managers. Um, it actually reads the Maven tool chains file. So if you use tool chains in Maven, it will figure out where these JVMs are and, and allow you to use them. Um, it can uh, reuse auto-provisioned results. Um, we, like there is today a feature for downloading a JVM, but it's pretty limited. It only works for the Adoptium vendor. Um, we have a slide just after for uh, a preview feature where we extend that. And you can also do explicit configuration. So from env allows you to list a series of environment variables that we expect to resolve to a Java home location. Um, or path is just the same, but without the end direction. So you immediately give us the path to the Java homes. I was mentioning provisioning. So in Gradle 7.6, we're going to introduce a new feature, um, which um, allows you in your setting script to declare Java repositories. So you will have to apply those as settings plugin. And then you declare them in order, because order matters, like where should, we, like where should Gradle search first for a JVM. Um, and um, in this um, repository, you give us also, and that's the link to the, uh, the, yeah, the, the community plugin, uh, what is the resolver class. And so one thing that will come out close to the 7.6 release is a Gradle plugin, a Gradle-owned plugin that will use the Fuji Disco API. And that effectively pretty much allows you to download uh, tool chains for all the recent vendors that we have. So I think some of the legacy ones are like Apple, HP, and uh, a legacy IBM, and also Oracle Enterprise, for example, because these are not like available on public endpoints. But for the rest, you'll be able to get um, uh, much more options than what we have today. Mm -hmm. um, 
in terms of the future, I've said it, more options. Um, and also, we, we are looking at in increasing the support in tasks. So for the core Gradle plugins, uh, we turned it on for check style in 7.5. Um, we're turning it on for more um, of these code analysis uh, core plugins uh, in 7.6, 7.6 to be released in the coming weeks. Um, and then a call to action is that if you see a community plugin that needs to run a JVM process, please ask them to have the support of the tool chains and also to honor what we do in the Java block. So they have ways to wire in the convention so that if you set the tool chain in the Java block, all of these tools provided by these plugins can be aligned on that version. Let's jump into test suites. So, we used to have documentation on the Gradle uh, documentation that explained how to add the concept of another test suite. The problem is it actually required you to manipulate a low level um, and, uh, of, of components, and there were some tricky um, bindings that you had to do, and out of the, I don't know, 50, 60 lines of code you had to write, um, if you missed that one or that one, mm -hmm. it would seem to work but actually fail. Um, and so that was clearly not good, and we know that with, with the um, ecosystem evolving, it's a frequent need to have different levels of testing, and the ability to separate them is interesting because not only can you model the test collection, but it effectively allows you to separate its sources, but also its dependencies. And what we've done is we've retrofitted the existing test uh, feature of Gradle into that system so that the test is actually a test suite, just like the rest. Um, let's switch back again to demo and see what we mean exactly. So, first of all, um, if you have a recent Gradle version, which is what I'm using here because my wrapper it's, is at Gradle 7.5.1, um, any Java plugin, any, Java, any plugin in the JVM ecosystem that applies the Java plugin will effectively apply um, the test suite plugin. And so what I can do with the test suite plugin is I can use a new top-level block, testing. And in the testing block, I can define suites. So now I'm using the Kotlin DSL, so it's part of the uh, specificities of the Kotlin DSL, but the way, the way I do that is I need to define a val, which is my integration test, which also that name is actually uh, giving a name to a number of the underlying plumbing concept, so that if you as a build author or as a plugin author have a need to go deeper, um, you know, how, like, it's documented how the name derivation works. Uh, but so I'm going to be by creating, and what I create is a JVM test suite. And that's, again, the notation I need um, in the Kotlin DSL. And so with that, what I have now is I've effectively created a place for my tests, and also tasks to uh, run them. Um, and including, like the place and the task includes all the dependencies configuration to which I can add dependencies to make sure that I have what, what's needed for, for running those tests. And so, for example, one thing that I need is in my dependencies block, um, I pretty much need a dependency on my main sources, right? because that's the point of the, um, uh, my integration test. Now, you may wonder why don't we wire that automatically? Well, because you could decide that declaring these test suites is done in a different project than the sources. And so you would be using some form of project notation. Uh, let's say that you're trying to test your utils project and you're elsewhere in your project structure. But here, I'm just looking at the project itself. Another use case could be doing, uh, what do we call now, clear box testing versus opaque box testing. You may be doing some integration tests. You don't want it to see the API or the internals of the code you're testing, in which case you, you, you'd omit this dependency block on, 
uh, 38 through 40. Uh, Looks like we lost the picture. I don't have the picture here anymore either, so sorry, folks. Because if I have the laptop in my hands above my head, that's not going to help, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, let me slightly describe um, what we're looking at while they look at that. So um, one thing we were, uh, we discussed the fact that I would mess up let's with my foot <laughs> on the comments below. Let's and I did it. Let's talk about the, the legacy setup while Louis gets plugged in again. So in the old documentation, you would have to define your own source set for integration test. You'd have to define your own configurations called yep integration test implementation, um, or th those would be created for you. You then have to wire together the dependencies you wanted, and finally you'd have to create your own tasks of type test, which then take all the inputs from the source sets. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was well documented, it was maybe 100 lines of code, and any one little thing goes wrong in there, like Louis said, it's over, so. And, and so here what you can see is that the implementation here is actually a contextual name. It's the implementation of the integration test. But we don't bother you anymore with the way these names get combined so that everything can coexist in a Gradle project. Um, here we can see that I decided to use GUnit Jupyter, and if I um, ask the pop-up for the documentation, I can see that it currently defaults to version 5.7.2. If that version doesn't work for me, um, I've got an alternative API, I think it's just here, like, and I can pass in the version. Mm -hmm. Um, then we have the way you um, still configure the, ta the tasks themselves. Because we all know that you may need system properties, um, like for example, um, it's a functional test, so you may need the, the, the remote address of that web services you in you're interacting with, or maybe a database connection. Um, you may also need to pass in um, some specific things related to your environment. And so you still need to configure these targets um, and so we go through a target block because even though right now this only creates a single test task, um, a, a very clear extension point for here would be to give you the ability to say that a, giv a given test suite needs to run, for example, against multiple Java version. And you can see that with the toolchain system and the ability to declare something like that in the future, because that's not yet in Gradle, at this level, would effectively allow you to have some form of metrics testing driven by your build. Nowadays, you mostly do that um, on the CI environment. Um, and so <coughs> now what I can do here um, is I can configure my test task. Um, and so um, an example, um, so it's very explicit, it's configured. Um, an example is that um, I want it to run after the regular test task. So it makes no sense for me to run um, um, the, the, the integration test um, before the regular unit test, for example. Um, but of course, it's a should run after, because if I don't run the regular test, I still want to run my integration test if that's what I invoked. Um, I said that we um, moved back the test into the suites. And so it means that this block effectively in, in, a, in a build that uses a test suite should no longer be declared outside, but should be declared inside. And so what I would do is I would have a val test by getting, which is again uh, um, a construction of the Kotlin DSL. And so here again, because what we were doing was configuring the target, and right now, I'm just going to configure all of the targets, but I can actually take that code and move it here. And all of that goes away, right? No. Yes. 
it needs to be in the test task dot configure. I forgot the level. So I think the point here is the symbol, the reference on lines thirty nine <coughs> and forty nine is both called test task, but that means something different because it's in the context of a different suite and a different suite target. And so what it does is it allows you to pass in a configuration closure for a task of type of type test, but it's not really the test task itself because as we've said, we're in in the targets block. Um, and um, we have this all, and so this could be different instances of the test task. And so what I can do is I can be outside of the all block and just do it per task, of course, if needed. Um, and now, I mean, I know it's a very simple project, but all of that works. So I can run test. Um, I can run... Um, no, not build, right? Missile break. Yeah, I'm going to break it because I've got the Spotbox plugin and it's not going to like all the groovy code I have for the yeah, for the test task and stuff. Um, Good W integration test. Yeah. So, but one thing that's missing in this context is that if I run build or check, hmm. something that did not run was my integration test because I'm, I did not wire that in. So, because it's an additional concept and it's not a default and it's your decision, you have to decide whether or not uh, some things like uh, checks, which is the, 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 the task that runs uh, all the thing, should depend on. And here, what's interesting is that the dependency, the way I declare it, is by using suites named integration test and that allows us to preserve this abstraction that this actually might represent more than one task. So it might very well be that what you're declaring here as a dependency is multiple tasks, because if your integration tests in the future run against multiple Java version, for example, that would be expressed here. That was it for test suites. I swear I paid attention to my feed this time. Okay. So like I've said, some of the evolutions, dimensions, um, we also need some uh, further work to integrate that better with code coverage. Like right now, if you apply check style or Jacoco, by default, it will only target your main tests, not, not these suites, these added suites. And so we need some higher level DSL to allow you to do that so that you don't, because otherwise right now, what you have to do is go back, grab, the task instances and, and configure them properly. Um, and so, yeah, that gives us kind of a, a big overview of all of that. Any questions at that level? Cool. I hope that means we were, yeah. Uh, no, if you are inside the test suite, then what you would do is you would not use all. And since by convention, the, Jav the, the Java toolchain that's configured at the Java extension level gets wired into all the tasks, you would just grab the single task that you, do, that you want to run differently and configure it. I mean, it's gonna, it, it would be very similar to what I did for the regular test, except that you would not do it in the all context. Doing a time check, I'm wondering if I'm not going to skip test fixtures, and maybe we'll do it at the end, um, and uh, so that we've got proper time. Mm -hmm. So I'll skip over that one, uh, hoping that we can get back to it. But I think we've got like more interesting content, and I just want to make sure that we we get through it properly. Um, however, publishing. Publishing is a bit of an annoying story in Gradle because we have lots of concepts and we've introduced um, a, um, a custom uh, metadata format uh, for good reasons, uh, but it means that doing the right thing in publishing is not always clear. And so what I want here is to really insist um, on, on a few things to make that pretty crystal clear. So the first part is what is published. 
you need to decide what you publish. What you publish, if you use the modern, like Gradle versions, it's either the Ivy Publish or the Maven Publish plugins. Um, and so what you publish is a component. Um, you should reach out to the component and not try to construct the publication inside the publishing block. And when you publish a component, you publish its variants. We'll see an example of what that means. Um, and we'll also uh, um, publish the, like the necessary metadata. Then, of course, we have to define where we publish. Um, it can be a Maven or an Ivy repository. And then the question is, how do you publish? So let's go back to code for that. So the first thing I need to do is apply the Maven Publish plugin. So now that I have applied that plugin, I'm going to refresh my Gradle configuration so that Gradle knows there is that plugin and has the necessary um, DSL extensions registered. And I can start by entering the publishing block. The publishing block allows me to declare publications. And so here, the notation, um, it's an older style of DSL. We probably wouldn't do it that way today. Uh, but with the way Kotlin works, what I do is I invoke the create method, and I pass in the uh, type parameter here. Um, and so I'm telling Gradle that I want to create a publication, but that publication is a Maven one. Like the alternative um, would be an Ivy one. And again, this is a consequence of the uh, block being common between the Maven publish and the Ivy publish plugin. Like I've said, we probably wouldn't do it that way uh, today. But now that I'm inside my Maven publication, the first thing I say is I want to use my Java components. And so the way I do that is the components, you can view it as a map. And so I use the map access notation. I'm effectively getting the component that's keyed by the Java, uh, by the Java key. And that's it. Here, I've pretty much defined in the context of my project that I'm going to, deep to publish that main component. Now, of course, if you want to publish to something like Maven Central, you have a number of requirements, like setting some metadata information, um, which is not needed for Gradle, right? This is purely something for the publication step. And so what you would do is like set the description, set um, the license, the committers, like all, all these requirements that Central has for very good reason, you would, you would set them here. And so here we can say that we're publishing an awesome library for DevOps Belgium, right? Shall I point out, this is in lieu of some legacy APIs where in this context you'd say with XML in Groovy script, and then you'd be parsing XML code directly. We don't want you to do this. No, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With, with XML should no longer be used. Like I hope we can really remove it soon. Um, one of the main reasons you shouldn't use it is that it allows you to modify metadata information that will not be reflected in the Gradle module metadata. And so you end up with inconsistent metadata, uh, which is really uh, bad. Um, so now I've effectively decided what to publish. And so I'm, I need to just say where. And so what I do is I create a repositories block. I can immediately say I'm going to publish to a Maven repo. What happens here is that the Maven repo is uh, created and it's automatically named. Um, if I don't name it, it's going to be Maven 1 up to Maven N if you have multiple of them. Um, and the thing it needs is a URL to publish to. And I'm just going to create a URI from a Kotlin string. And for example, what I can do is project build here. and put it there. Uh, I think it's built here. Yes. So here what I'm saying is that I want a local repo on disk, which is located under my build directory, which is the, the, the place where Gradle normally places all of its output. And I just call it repo. One of the benefits is that I could publish locally before publishing to a remote repository and run a few tasks to validate that my publication is what I expect. Um, and so if I run that, yeah. 
So here in my build repository, I'll find my repo. And I can see that I've got here like my jar, different um, checksums, the POM file because we're publishing to Maven, so we're making it compatible, and the module file, which is the Gradle module metadata. I'm not going to dive into this format. Um, the, what I really wanted to convey was um, this notion that what do I publish with a bit of configuration that makes sense for the publication itself, and then where do I publish? And then, of course, if you have multiple repositories, what Gradle allows you to do is that you can select, and if you've got multiple publications, because you may have multiple publications in a single project, um, you, you, we generate multiple tasks that have like a combination of the publication and the repo, the target repo name, and so you can decide which ones to run. Like you don't have to run all of them. So in the context of that uh, potential validation, uh, you would be able to just publish locally, run the validation, and then do the proper remote publishing. Okay, so like we've said, what's published? The component models a set of variants. Um, if we get back to the test fixtures, I'll go slightly deeper in detail into what that means. And for the Java plugins, you should publish the Java component. Um, whenever you go to a different ecosystem, like Android or Kotlin, look up at their documentation. They usually have a different component, and that's what you should publish again. Um, because if you try to publish the Java component in the context of an Android project, you'll either get an error or publish something completely different than what you expected. If you want to do customizations, and they concern stuff that the component drives, please use the component and modify the component. Um, if you want to add, for example, additional artifact, do that through a variant. Um, when we add that small snippet that with the Java plugin did with sources jar, when you do that, we actually create a proper variant that points at the sources jar uh, meaning that for the Maven ecosystem, you'll still see sources as a classified artifact. But for Gradle, you get a real variant with its own attributes and potentially its own dependencies. Now, dependencies for sources may be a weird concept, so, okay, you don't have dependencies, but that still is a, a feature. The metadata, you can manipulate the POMXML, but you really should not do it. Um, and one clear reason is that we do not provide you with the API to do that for the Gradle module metadata. There is no public API in Gradle that allows you to manipulate it. Um, and so mutating the POM XML with the with XML that Kyle was mentioning earlier would lead to discrepancies. Um, and so again, modify the component. Of course, if we talk about all the meta information about your project that appears in the published POM.xml, the POM block you have is dedicated for that. A few tricks that I mentioned in the demo, you can do local repository publication for performing some validation. Um, something to know about the dependencies, like Gradle has this rich uh, dependency version declaration, you may want to actually publish the resolved version and not the declared ones, so that the consumer downstream have a simpler set of information to resolve from. Um, and nowadays, if you need to publish to Maven Central, um, that's the plugin you should be using. Um, it's the more modern, um, it's a collaboration between different teams, like some folks at Gradle, some folks outside, um, and it's what will give you the best result. And I, I've promised to Sonotype that we would help update their documentation. <laughs> that is still to be done. So that's the most updated info you can get. Has, can I interrupt? Has anyone ever tried to set up a publish to Maven Central on their own, like from scratch? I've done it. <laughs> All right. Was it fun? My friends, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, well, you have strict requirements on yeah. the contents of the POM, right? Of uh, ASCII armor, signature files, yeah. checksums for all your inputs. Um, and then there's the sort of staging repository. Yeah. It passes validation. You can click on the website and manually promote it, right? This is going to automate all that for you. So yeah. if you're publishing open source, uh, this is an excellent, excellent tool and a huge time saver. So that was it for the JVM features. Um, last round of question on that section. Just 
you repeat the question? No, uh, yeah. So the question is, um, if you do um, um, local publication for snapshots, you will create a lot of snapshots locally. Um, and is there a way to reduce or put a maximum? The answer is no. We, d we don't have such a control, so like the cleanup effectively will have to be done by your build as well uh, in, in an automated way. We, we sorry, in, uh, yeah, fine. You have to do the cleanup effectively. So we, we don't have automation around that. The snapshot cleanup is normally a function of your binary artifact repository yes. like Sonotype Nexus or JFrog Artifactory. It might have a retention policy of the last 10 binaries or yeah. t two weeks of, of published snapshots, yeah. something like that. That's not but something yeah, we... It's true we that's something you're losing by using a local publication. There was a hand... Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe all maybe stretching. Yeah. All good then. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the question is when you're publishing to Maven Central, what does the resulting POM file actually contain? Can I, can I answer this one? Go ahead. So um, a classic criticism of Maven and the POM file specifically is that it's somewhat schizophrenic, meaning it has a dual personality or fulfills two roles. It's both the instructions to build your software using the Maven build tool, and it's also instructions on a consumer of your software how to consume it. So the POM file that Gradle generates is only the latter half of that. It's only the list of dependencies that are required and the scopes for the consumer of your software component. The build instructions and all those pieces, of course, that's what the Gradle build scripts are for. And so you end up with an equivalent POM from the consumer's point of view because it's going to ignore like the build element of the POM. Right? It's just not there when you use Gradle. Yeah. 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 Yep. And so it will be mostly metadata and dependencies, effectively. Yep. Like you will have no um, plugin section, no profile section, none of that. Yep. No build section. Yeah. No build section. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk Sh about time. Yep. It's been an hour and eight minutes. Do you need a break? Yeah, I, see, I see some yeses. Yes. Should we do 15 minutes then? Yep, so we meet back at 5 before 3 in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. If during the break you want stickers, come get them. Those who asked question, please be fair. You can also come grab a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask a question to the group. This is my first time in in Belgium, and I'm wondering, am I, am I alone? Has anyone else been for the first time? Okay, a couple other people. Thank you. Um, I want to say I've been so nervous before giving my talk. There's two two things I really want to do a lot of in Belgium. That's eat chocolate and drink beer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went to Chocolate Nation in uh, downtown Antwerp, and it was amazing. It was smiling like a child. But the beer part I'm saving for after this is done. So if yeah, anyone's around, I'll see you there. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so thanks. OK, so uh, we're going to talk now about build logic. Um, and what's the agenda for the second half? We're going to talk about build logic and also testing uh, extensions, right? When you create a plugin to extend the Gradle platform, uh, what does that mean? And how can you write regressions and things like that to assure yourself and your users that the, the custom logic you're providing is going to work every time? So um, what are the building blocks of a Gradle build? This could be a little bit of review for you know the group that's already using Gradle. But at the very minimum, right? you want to have a Gradle build, you have to have a settings file. 
right? Settings.gradle or settings.kts. That's it. That that's all you need. And now you know IntelliJ or any IDE will look at that and recognize it as a Gradle build. But there's only one per repository, right? On top of that, if you have multiple subprojects, you define one build.gradle file for each project. Some ancillary files that are important, uh, gradle.properties. If you have key value pairs you want to make available to your build scripts, this is where you'd put them. It's the Java property spec format. So, you know, string equals string. Um, there's also the Gradle wrapper. Louis mentioned this in the, in the beginning. So this is how we bootstrap the Gradle build tool at a fixed version inside your project. So any, any environment that wants to invoke your build would only need to have Java installed. The Gradle then runs a shell script or a batch file, depending on your operating system. There's a very small jar that you check into source control. It doesn't change very often, so don't anyone freak out about checking a jar. It's I think it's 32 kilobytes or maybe 64, whatever the smallest unit is on, on disk, uh, and it, never, it very seldom changes. So that goes and bootstraps Gradle, downloads the full tool. We talk about version catalogs, right? The default path at Gradle slash libs.versions.toml. And then you have some other things like the, you know, there's a .gradle folder inside your project where some of the task execution state, and we'll talk about that means later, uh, is stored. You've also got the Gradle user home. Uh, there's a .gradle folder underneath your home folder, and that's where, uh, for example, dependencies or jar files you've already downloaded get stored and cached, as well as um, um, additional metadata. So, uh, how many people's first experience with Gradle was groovy? Right? There's a common misconception. Thank you for everyone put their hand up. There's a common misconception that Gradle is written in groovy. Um, that is 100% false. I think we have one or two classes that wire together like some adapt adapter layer between the groovy language and Gradle. Almost everything is written in Java. And what this sort of Tetris graph is trying to illustrate is on the bottom is the Gradle API. This is what our API, API doc exposes. There are you know normal Java Bean style methods backing nearly all the concepts you saw Louis doing before, like with the test suites and things like that. Those are you know these are all backing Java classes. You then have a couple ways of interacting with this, right? Um, this sort of blue, dark blue piece in the middle, that's the Gradle DSL. Right now there are two flavors, the Groovy DSL and the Kotlin DSL. You also have plugins, right? Uh, plugins could be written using either of the two DSL languages, or I told you the Gradle API is written in Java, you can write a plugin in pure Java. And depending on your environment, this is actually what we recommend you do. Finally, the final way that probably most of you got your start with uh, customizing Gradle is with the actual build scripts themselves. Right? So of course you're using one of the two DSLs, Kotlin or Groovy, inside a build script. You're interacting with the APIs just like you saw Louis do in his demos earlier. So in the previous slide, I mentioned both build scripts and plugins. Um, those are two different vehicles, two different ways to achieve the same thing, which is configuring the model, configuring what you want to do with the build. So here we have, um, you know, three different ways of, of configuring your build. Configuration, right? This is what you've probably done in your first Hello World Gradle build, right? You're, you're going to your build script, you are accessing the existing DSL objects, and you're, you're, you're telling Gradle what you want to do. Not necessarily how to do it, but using our, our, our DSL and our APIs what to do. The problem is, is you know, for a Hello World project, that's great, but what if now um, you want to, say, um, change the output folder of a task, and you have 10 different sub-projects? Just like with your, your Java source code, you don't want to repeat yourself. You don't want to be copy-pasting things in other places. So this is where we, we encourage use of what we call a convention plugin. So this is where you, you basically implement your code snippet once. It's published internally within your project. 
called a convention plugin that can be accessed and applied by multiple places. So just like when we looked at version catalogs earlier, if you need to go change a version value, you can go do it in one place. If you need to modernize or um, mature your logic, you go to your convention plugin, you change it there, and it's now already applied everywhere. Finally, there's the concept of a binary plugin, which is you, you write a plugin in Java, and then you, you publish it. Uh, you could publish it internally within like your company's firewall for use internally, or plugins.gradle.org. This is what we call our plugin portal. And um, we have about 6,000 community developed plugins that are published and maintained there. So how do you write a Gradle plugin? Well, you, you use Gradle. It's very meta. So uh, we have these very brief three little code snippets. We have three different tools we make available to you to sort of bootstrap the process of authoring your own plugin. The first one you see is called Java Gradle plugin. You, you basically start a new Gradle project, you apply this plugin. This is going to allow you to start creating a Java binary plugin in the same way. The second one allows you to use Groovy. And finally, the Kotlin DSL is the third option. When you apply any one of these three to a project, uh, Gradle uh, enables a lot of things under the hood for you. Turn, um, if you remember, I think one of the very first code snippets, Louis applied the Java plugin, and then boom, a Java DSL closure gets created that wasn't there automatically. Along those same lines, a lot of things happen when you apply these plugins. So first of all, we, we provide you uh, the model to uh, configure, you know, name your plugin, describe what's the implementation class. Uh, we provide validation tools to ensure that your plugin you're authoring adheres to best practices. We provide you test fixtures, which I'm going to go into a lot of detail later, that show you how to write integration tests for your plugins. Uh, I mentioned the metadata, like how you're going to declare your plugin, the namespace, how it'll be accessed, what's the ID of the plugin. And then finally, we automate the process to publishing to the plugin portal that I mentioned earlier. So I want you to think of Gradle as, as a platform, right? Um, the code snippet you're looking at here is a sample implementation of a custom task. And um, the point of this is, number one, it's abstract. So just like you're used to working with a dependency injection framework, perhaps, like Spring, Micronaut, Quarkus, whatever, um, you'll see we have an inject annotation here and an abstract class. So when you define something, Gradle at runtime, at the build execution time, that's what I mean by runtime, will create it for you. Um, we, we inject services, and yeah, you can see the code snippet on the bottom. When we want to create that, we create a new instance of something. You don't need to instantiate it yourself. So there are technically three different types of plugins you can create in Gradle. Um, the, the bullet point project settings in Gradle, these are in effect the, the argument to the type parameter on the first line you'll see on the code snippet. So uh, the most typical type of plugin people create are project plugins. Right? This is exactly as if you were writing some Groovy or Kotlin code in one of your build scripts. Imagine extracting that dropping it in a plugin, giving it a name, and now you apply that plugin. It's going to have the same effect as the code you extracted from your build script. Settings is a, a little bit more rare use case uh, where you can apply logic to the DSL changes in the settings.gradle. Remember I said there's only one of those in a project where you could have multiple build.gradle files. And finally, there's a, there's a third case. I just want to mention it for uh, completeness. I won't go into the details where you can have an initialization plugin, and that's where you, you use the Gradle type. Uh, so that allows you to influence the, the bootstrapping of, the, of Gradle itself when it's invoked. Um, probably the easiest way to get started with plugin authorship is to use a pre-compiled script plugin. So you don't even have to interact with the Java API if you don't want to. You can just use your existing Kotlin or Groovy scripts and extract them. 
So these, these three source paths here show you examples of the three types of plugins. Uh, you could put this uh, in, a, in a special module or a special subproject we have called build source. You can just drop something like named like this in that folder, and it's now the plugin with this name, com example my plugin, is now available to every project in your in your repository. Um, definitely provide a namespace though. Uh, we have some strict validation, so only we are allowed to call something without a namespace, right? So like you apply the plugin called Java, right? We know that that's ours. Uh, you can't name something like Foo. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get we'll get mad at you. So I think you remember this, this graph from, from earlier when Louis talked about uh, up to date, whether to execute, pull something from the cache. Um, so these are all, this relates to the inputs of a task. So what is a task? A task is an individual unit of work in Gradle. When we see invoke something from the command line, you're, you're passing you know, the Gradle, Gradle W if you invoke the wrapper followed by one or more task names. Sometimes you also, I think I should explicitly mention, we use this colon delimited syntax sometimes. So if you run Gradle W help, that's the same as Gradle W space colon help. It's just a, that colon means you're referencing the, the root, root project rather than a nested subproject. Sometimes that syntax is not, not natural and not obvious at first glance. So the important thing to mention about tasks is treat them like you would authoring a function. A task needs to have inputs and outputs in the same way that when you're authoring a function, you give it arguments and a return type. Those two are, you know, completely analogous. Every output of a task needs to be file-based. Some of the examples we'll go through later, I have a task that takes like a folder full of files as one of its inputs and also like a system property or some string value, something like that as an input. That's okay for the inputs, but everything we do in Gradle to optimize your build, check for task up-to-date status, and cache things all depends on files being written to by the task output. So just the, the one key takeaway here is inputs can be files or properties or something in memory, but the outputs need to be on disk. Uh, the last point, what happens when inputs or output changes, that's what Louis mentioned before. Uh, we, we're going to go through this, this logic again, right? And, the, and this is the reason why Gradle uh, is so efficient, because you've declared this is exactly what this task cares about, this is what it writes to disk. We then chain different tasks together, and that's how we end up with um, the efficiency efficiencies we get when you don't change anything, you want to run again, and it, you know, within less than a second we say, oh, nothing to do here. We keep track of the inputs and the outputs. When you're writing your own plugin, one of the first things we suggest you do is check its incremental behavior. Right? You don't even this doesn't even need to be a test, right? You've written some logic, maybe you've in a build script you define a custom task, copies a file from here to there, something like that. Just run the same thing twice. The second time if everything is declared correctly, it should say up to date. And this is, this is you know, assuming whatever process you're invoking has deterministic outputs, right? That's a that's a key key component of having an efficient build. It needs to produce the same thing every time with no side effects. You run something, run it again. Nothing to do here. An evolution of this. Right? Once you've you know, checked you have incremental behavior, an evolution of this is the build cache. It's not on by default. You have to enable it. You go to your gradle.properties file, and you, we have a special property you set to enabled equals true. Then what you can do is you can take a checkout of your project with the same logic. You check it out in you know, my checkout one, my checkout two. But you give them different paths on disk. You run the task you think you've, you've created, which you, th you believe is cacheable. You run it on the first checkout. It's going to wrap up the results, put them in the local build cache. Then you want to run it again from a different subfolder. If you've wired everything up correctly, the result of invoking on the second folder is from cache. 
So what does that mean? Gradle takes a checksum, a hash of all the inputs to each of the declared tasks, and then it also takes a checksum of the state of the outputs of that task. So when Gradle runs a task again, it computes the hash of all its inputs once more. Based on that input, um, the outputs of when the task was previously executed, they're put into a zip file, a gzip, using that hash of when the task was first executed. And that gzip, take, I said, contains the outputs of the task. So if you're running a task once more with the exact same inputs, Gradle looks in the cache, it says, I computed a key, we'll call it dead beef, right? It finds dead beef.gzip in its cache folder. It says, I know what the, in the, the result of invoking this task with these inputs is going to be. It then takes that gzip file, extracts it into the declared output folder of your task, and nothing to do. So you can see how this is a big time saver, for example, for Java compilation. If you have 100 different source files, none of them have changed. Uh, computing, you know, all the lambdas and everything else that they contain is potentially CPU-intensive process. We know nothing has changed. It's the same Java version, things like that. Now we just we find the result in the cache and we restore it. You basically skip go, collect two hundred dollars, get the monopoly meme. And the impact clearly on something like Scala is even bigger. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Java compilation is not that slow, yeah. but I'm sure we've all worked on projects that defy that logic. So here's two examples of a class uh, side by side that are going to behave poorly versus behave better. Okay, the task on the left, um, who, who can tell me what's wrong with it? Thank you. Yes, annotations are missing. So my task on the left has two properties inputs and output, but they don't declare to Gradle using our annotations what those names mean. Of course, as a human, we look at it, we know exactly what the intent is, but this task has not told the Gradle engine, if you will, the Gradle platform, what, it, what it's doing. So to correct this task, look at the code snippet on the right, uh, for the property called inputs, Sorry, if you're not familiar with, with Kotlin syntax, I'm not very good with, with Kotlin. Um, we said at get, that means put an annotation on the getter of this property. And the annotation is our, is from Gradle, this is or Gradle API input files. This says that this is, this is gonna be a folder and we care about the hash of all the files in this folder. We're gonna compute that and that's gonna become the cache key. And then um, the annotation on the output property. This is saying this is where whatever this task does, this is the folder where it's going to write those files to. So going back to what I said on the previous slide, Gradle, the, when this task is requested to be run again, we say, oh, we compute the, the SHA of everything. If nothing has changed uh, and we find a hit in the, in, the, in the cache for that, then we can just extract that and basically skip the invocation. The third invitation, annotation, you'll see on the slide is task action. Um, every task you write has to have some void method. You can call it anything you want, but you have to annotate it with task action. That tells Gradle, you know, okay, I've computed the inputs, they're out of date, or I checked the cache, I, I don't have an entry there. Now I actually, it's too bad, I have to actually run this task. That's what running the task means, just do whatever is in the task action annotated method. And, and that's why it's the only annotation that's present on the left-hand side, because if you don't have that, then you actually do not have a task. Yep. Um, I should say in, in modern Gradle, uh, this wasn't always the case with our validations, but when you're using the Java Gradle plugin, Groovy Gradle plugin, or Kotlin DSL, we now apply a new task that validates. It's called, I think, validate plugins, even though it really validates tasks. And it would, it would flag this example on the left and say, actually, no, that's legal. No, it's not. Uh, it's evolving. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, if you have a, uh, it will warn you if you have public properties like inputs and outputs that are not annotated. It'll say either make those private 
or uh, you need to annotate them and let me know are they inputs or outputs or something else. Yes. Yes. So um, maybe I didn't do a very good job talking about this earlier, but thinking about Gradle, uh, sorry, the question was, is the reason why the tasks are declared abstract? And um, maybe I didn't do a good job explaining earlier, but it's because we want you to think of Gradle as a, like a dependency injection platform like, like Spring Boot, right? Where um, let us instantiate the tasks for you. Um, also, if you are a plugin author, this can sort of save you save you some pain where um, it, it might prevent people from trying to test my task in the incorrect way. Maybe that I'll, I'll, I'll save that for later. You have a, a additional answer about our decorator or anything like that? No, no, I, like think that. It's, I think it's that. And maybe one more reason is that it makes sure that you will not try to write a new in your plugin code which would effectively break at runtime within Gradle because whatever you instantiated is not what Gradle needs to, to work with. So this example is all about making this task incremental, meaning if there's nothing new to do, if you've already run it once locally, it'll just say up to date, nothing to do again. The next slide we're going to talk about making a task cacheable. So there's two additional changes here. The first is annotating the task class as cacheable task. So done, right? Nothing to do. Unfortunately, no, and be very careful with this one. Uh, definitely write tests, uh, which we'll talk about how to do that in a while. Um, because as soon as you mark a task as cacheable, we believe you. So if there's any side effect, uh, anything else you do wrong, Gradle will say, okay, for these inputs, it's always going to produce this exact same output, and we only ever compute that once. So you, you can get yourself into trouble. Now, there's another annotation we've added, and this involves sort of um, a workaround for some legacy behavior that was put there for reasons. But the inputs on the property called inputs, by default, Gradle will use the absolute path of all those input files as part of the key. We stored the path to the files as well as the checksum of each of the contents of the files. And again, that's for legacy reasons. This is almost certainly not what you want. So for legacy reasons, like I said, we have to leave it absolute for now. We're, we just talked last week about evolving this in a, in a future major release, but 99% of the time you want the path to the input files for this task to be relative path. So relative to the project in which this task is executing, find the files there. Once you've done this, uh, I talked about, you know, check out your project into, you know, my checkout one, my checkout two. If you didn't have this relative annotation, caching wouldn't work. Once you have this, you run the, you run the code once, it goes into your Gradle user home, you run it a second time from a different folder, and it's restored. This is an important concept. Are there any questions about this? Yes? Why is that on the, the output as well? The question is, why is the path sensitivity not on the output as well? Uh, it's a good question. I believe it's because the Output folder by default is relative to the subproject. For legacy reasons, the input's not. Do you remember why? <laughs> the answer is because. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mentioned our validation tools. This is one of the mistakes you could easily make. It's a, it's a very good question. We will catch it and say, oh, you can't put this path-sensitive annotation on an output property. Yes? The question is, if you change the output folder, then the outputs are also different? You, um, yes. Yep. Technically, no, but talk to me later. <laughs> we, the, it would be the same entry in the cache 
but because you changed the class path of the build, we would have to run the task again. The result would be the same, just in a different folder. No need to talk to me later. So a lot of opt-ins to consider. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, a question. Is it possible to define two tasks with the same output? Yes, it's possible. Don't do that. Um, it, it, no, Gradle, Gradle 3.5 had this bug. Um, you could do what we call mixed, mixed compilation. So you could have Java and Scala sources in the same project. You'd have source main Java and source main Scala. So what we did is we'd compile the class files and write them to build slash main slash output. And then we'd also write class files to build slash main slash output from the result of the Scala compilation. So weird, weird things happen. Uh, so that is, you should never have overlapping outputs, right? So we, we, we had that bug when the, we first implemented the build cache. Now that's one of the validations we talk about here is detecting overlapping outputs. Um, I'm not sure the behavior, will we, will we fail? When that happens? Uh, we've added validation. I think we nag you telling you you're wrong, and we effectively disable pretty much all up-to-date checks, caching, and all of that for your build. Yeah, we so. will warn you and say, hey, I've detected two different tasks that are in the execution plan. They share a common output folder. This is, a, this is really bad, so we're going to disable all of the performance benefits right, of incremental behavior and cache ability because we just can't say anymore. Yeah. And Gradle eight should fail. And now you fail with our next major version, which is coming when? Before <laughs> the end of the year. Sometime this year, yeah. I didn't say which year. Yeah, <laughs> uh, before the end of a year, yeah. I mentioned when you apply one of our plugin sort of helper plugins, you, you, we, we have a task uh, called validate plugins. It helps you identify some of these some of these smells. So how many of you know how many of you have ever made a change to like production class? <laughs> I don't need to write tests, just check it in and deploy it. Yeah. One, two, three. You guys oh just, just. And, are you are you missing work this week to come to DevOps or do you not have <laughs> jobs anymore? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um there's there's been an attitude since as long as I've been an engineer for more more than twenty years of build code, just you know. Just do it. It's fine. Just give it to the intern. He'll fix it and check it in and, and go. Um, that attitude, I think, still is pervasive today. Uh, we'd like to change that, and we give you the tools, the test fixtures, to help you write tests to ensure that your build is going to do the right thing the first time and every time. So these doc links, um, by the way, we had a good question earlier about publishing the slides. Uh, Louis and I will tweet a link, and then we'll try and get Gradle's official account to tweet it later today or tonight. So everyone, please follow at Gradle uh, on Twitter, and we'll expose that way. And you'll see the link to um, these documents. Okay, now I'm going to try and demo. You need the cable, right? get to the project browser. Command one. <coughs> Voila. Uh, 
Okay. I want us to focus on this project called Plugin. And we'll walk us through um, the build script to define a build of a Gradle plugin. I'm going to show us the, the implementation of the plugin itself. And then we'll talk about um, the supporting objects, the extension and the test that the plugin um, applies to the project. And finally, we'll look at the unit tests and the integration tests. So I mentioned one of the three ways to define a plugin build was either the, the Java Gradle plugin, Groovy Gradle plugin, or Kotlin DSL. So we're going to use Kotlin for this one. Um, I'll skip over the testing stuff that Louis, Louis showed. There's not, not much of a change there. When you apply one of our, our three plugins I mentioned for plugin authors, oops, the Gradle plugin, this is a DSL that gets added automatically. And here we say, okay, the name of our, the ID of our plugin is example.greeting, and we have an implementation class to wire that ID to something that actually extends plugin. Uh, we do a little more customization of the, of the test suite below. We, we made something here called functional test instead of integration test, but same idea. Any questions about the, the setup for our plugin build yet? Okay. So here's the implementation of my plugin. Let's talk about all the all the parts we see here. Um, by the way, this has nothing to do with Java. If you're not a, a Java engineer, then don't worry. There's nothing specific to that here. The first thing we do on lines four, five, six is we apply something called the base plugin. Uh, base is like the bare minimum sort of life cycle you'd put in any project. Most other plugins apply this for you, Java, Groovy, whatever. But base is going to basically give us the clean task and the build task. Probably a couple others I'm forgetting, but that, that's it. So now line eight, what's this thing called file processing? This is an extension. So we are registering our own extension to the DSL. And this is an object which is going to store shared configuration that we want to expose to the user in an easy way to configure. And that's going to be consumed later by one or more of our tasks. So the type of the extension is called file processing extension. And we give it a name. And then in the DSL, the user can choose to address this by the name by the type, or both. Finally, line 10, we're going to register a task. right? So we're saying, set up this task in this build. The type of the task is file processing task. We name the task process files. Notice that I think kind of our recommended best practice is it's task is a verb. And now we set three properties. We configure three properties on the task. Um, first is something, the task exposes something, you know, from the Java doc tells us, uh, called processing. We set the value of this to the result of the processing property of our extension. I'll show you the source code of that in just a second. Apparently this task also has an input directory and an output directory. And so we set sort of conventional values for these. We're saying on line 12, uh, find, there'll be a folder relative to the project directory called input. Go look there. And for output directory, we said there's going to be a folder called output under the build directory. We'll go look at the implementations of file processing extension and file processing task in just a second. But before I jump there, any questions? OK. So here's our extension. This is really simple. It's just an interface. In fact, it says I have a Kotlin error, too. I don't even need this. All right. So this extension just defines a property called processing. I don't want to spend too much time on our property and provider API today. But just know that um, this wrapper type called property 
essentially tells me that this is something that can be lazily evaluated. It has a lot in common with optional in Java. Like you can test, has this value been set before you consume it? You can avoid null pointers. You can depend on this and say, it, I know it's going to be a string, but I don't need to actually compute the value yet. Okay, now let's look at the task. There's a bit more to go through here. First of all, we can see the two inputs and the one task output. Processing is marked with the simplest annotation, which is input. This tells me as a task author that this is not file-based. This could be coming from um, an environment variable, a, excuse me, a system property, something else. If I tried to make the backing type of the processing field on line 16 a file, our validation would warn you. So you probably want to use input file or input files for that. So lines 18 and 19, we're defining uh, the input directory and we tag that as input files. That tells Gradle, hey, this is a folder. There's a whole bunch of files inside there. Compute the checksum of the task's up-to-dateness or its build cache entry based on the combination of the two inputs, right? Finally, lines 21, 22 is the output directory. And this, you know, as we've discussed, this is where whatever this task does, whatever the result of the task action method is, this is where this task is going to write things to. So this is all the wiring that Gradle needs in order to know how to check whether this task is up to date. And if the build cache is enabled, where to go fetch the results and restore them to disk. As I mentioned, you have to have one method annotated with task action. And so this is where we're actually going to finally do the work. And this is just a silly toy task. I, you know, don't, don't stress about the implementation. It just copies some files. Uh, but basically, we we do some setup here on these three lines. We're just saying resolve the value of the output directory, go delete its contents, and then recreate it. It's recreate it. We then resolve the the input directory for each file in the input directory. We've got a helper method here defined on line forty that we invoke. And again, like what this does, or if you don't use Kotlin often, it doesn't really matter. Just just know that this process file, we're going to go to the output folder. We, we take the content of each input file, and we we reverse it and, and rewrite it to the output. It's a trivial example, but the point is to explain the interplay of the declared task inputs and the task output. OK, any questions on this before we move on to testing? OK. If you remember in our build script for this project, we set up a functional test. We see a, a, an additional source set gets created here in addition to the default test. But let's look at the unit test first. Unit testing a Gradle plugin there's not a lot you can do. Basically, all you're going to do is certify the side effects on your project of applying your plugin. Two, I want to make very clear, there's two things you, you cannot or, or shouldn't, shouldn't do because you can't trust the results, and that's you cannot resolve dependencies, and you cannot execute tasks in a unit test. We'll, do, we'll definitely do that in our functional test in a moment. But looking at this, this test class, all we do is line 14, we create kind of a dummy, empty project. Line 15, we apply our plugin to that project. And then line 16, we assert that there's a task has been created in that project called process files. Um, we could also um, test that our plugin when it's applied. It just runs through it. You know, Gradle just processes that code like a script. 
we can also check like there should be there should be an extension called file processing I think you get the idea but that's it we can't actually invoke any code we can't change any values we just want to make sure when we apply the plugin that the state of the project is what we expect it to be okay now we'll look at functional testing Okay, there's a bit more boilerplate here. Let me go through it quickly and we'll get to the, to the real um, interesting stuff. So this is just a, a Kotlin test. You know, you've probably all done this in JUnit tests, have a temporary folder. Then we then extract a couple convenience variables. We're gonna have something called a project dir, which is just basically this, the same as our temporary folder. We're gonna create a file, or create a path to a file. Relative to our project directory, we're going to call it build.gradle. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to create a toy project that we're going to actually invoke and then check the results of invoking that task. Finally, we have a settings file. So here's where things get interesting. Uh, in this project under test, in this toy build, we don't, we don't actually need our settings file. There's nothing specific we needed to write to this, so we just leave it blank. In our sample project, here's what we do. We apply our plugin, and then remember, we had the property string in the extension. We have to give that a value because our task consumed that as a value. If we tried to run the task without giving this some value, the task would get upset and say, no value has been set for this property. I tried to evaluate it lazily, and it was empty. Um, think of like optional dot is present. So we just give it some string value. Uh, last bit of boilerplate here on line 42, we're just creating our input files. So go to the folder named input relative to the project dir, create file one, file two dot text, and just write some content to them. That's it. Now here's where things get interesting. I wanna talk about the Gradle runner. This is our integration test or functional testing test fixture. This is very much like if you use the builder pattern. Um, this is what you're going to do to essentially create the setup to invoking Gradle. Let me talk about what each of the um, methods we invoke. First of all is forward output. That's just going to take uh, when this Gradle runner invokes Gradle in a separate process, we're just going to pipe the standard out back to this test's output. Just to you don't have to do this, it's just convenience for troubleshooting. With plugin class path, this ensures that the jar created by building our plugin and containing the test and the, the extension is on the class path of our, of our project. Um, most of the, there's very rare case where you don't need to have this, but um, just know that you'll need to have this method. We now say with projector, we have to tell the runner where, you know, where, where's the project located, what's the root folder of your project. And then finally, the arguments. This is just like if you were invoking Gradle from the command line, you type dot slash Gradle W, everything you'd follow after that. So in this case, it's explicitly invoking the task named process files. So, so now we're all set up. Like we've, this is like our factory or our builder method, but we, now we actually got to call, we got to actually invoke it or create something from it. So Gradle Runner has a build method, which returns a build result. Okay, so build result has two interesting things um, we can access to check what Gradle did. First is the result has a method called task. We can pass that the path, the fully qualified path to a Gradle task. I talked about the colon delimiter earlier. So even though we asked for process files, 
the the correct fully qualified invocation is colon process files because it's in the root project so we look for the result of this task and this returns a a build task it's kind of an intermediate object you don't need to worry about but the important part is task outcome this returns an enum value in fact i can go look at the enum and you'll you should be familiar with these these different states success failed of state skip from cache from source we've talked about two or three of these at length today oops So line 55 asserts that when we ran the process files task, the outcome was success. This was the first time we ran it, so it's not up to date. It better not be skipped. Shouldn't be from cache. It better be success. And then for lines 56, 57, uh, we're just going to uh, call result.output. So this, is, this exposes to us the console output of when Gradle was invoked. And so if there's a specific logging message or something like that we're looking for, we could go um, check that that output contains some string that we're looking for. Additionally, you might want to uh, maybe go find the contents of file1.txt. You don't need our APIs. We don't, in fact, give you anything to do what you might normally do to test like that. You've got a build directory um, reference we, or build file. Sorry, we don't have a build directory. We have a project directory. You know that your file should be written to build slash output slash file one dot text. So you could just, using Java, Kotlin, whatever, find the contents of that file, open it, and assert its contents. Right? There's nothing special about about Gradle for doing those types of assertions. I think one thing that's important to note is that uh, <coughs> these um, assertions on the output are mostly for the demo purpose. On a real plugin, you would want your plugin to only add things to the output when it makes sense, like if you right. have a warning or yeah. something important. Um, but you may not be like using output assertion logic for a real plugin. You might um, you might use it for sort of anti-testing, like assert there's no deprecation warnings, right? Output does not contain <coughs> blah. Um, but yeah, it's remember I said that tasks output always must be file based. So if you're invoking a, a task, it probably wrote something to disk somewhere. You should assert you know the state of it is what you expected to happen. And then just one last note: we we invoke the runner. We build it one more time. So this goes back to a couple slides ago. I talked about your um, incrementality check and then also your cacheability check. So line 60, 60 through 62 is without changing the properties of your Gradle Runner builder, just call it again. Call it twice in the same folder. Now we've asserted the task status should be up to date. The input files haven't changed. Nobody went and deleted the output folder. The output folder hasn't changed, so we're, we're done. I think that's all I wanted to show. Anything else? No, I think it's good. Yep. OK, are there any questions before I go back to slides? Yes? S sorry. Is the line 49 useful for the line 55 config? Or is the result stored somewhere else? So Thank you. The question is, is line 49 useful for asserting on the outputs? And the answer is no. This is purely a convenience. Um, let's say you're writing, you know, w when you invoke the Gradle runner, um, as, with, as with Maven, you know, Gradle launches a test in a separate JVM. From the, there's the Gradle daemon, then there's the test JVM. By default, Gradle runner creates a third JVM. And its standard out is not wired back to the, te the VM invoking the test. So the assertions would still fail on 56 and 57, even if you comment out line 49, but it'll be less obvious to you why it failed, right? Same, yeah, no, yeah. 49 is, is purely a convenience. It, if you have a complex plugin that creates lots of tasks and doing lots of things, you might want to turn forward output off because it'll, it'll pollute your, 
your logs. You maybe only want to go turn it on when you have a problem. Okay. When we'll share the slides and uh, the demos and everything, you'll see that the rest of the test is actually um, testing when you have made the task properly incremental um, and verifying that if you add a file, then only that new file is processed and things like that. So it's uh, an extension effectively of from some of the topics we're, we're touching on today. I could, I could talk for a week about plugin testing, but we don't have a week, so. Oh. Yeah, you need to go oh, I do the upper the right corner. Yeah. How many engineers does it take? Make sure I got all my bullet points. I mentioned everything I wanted to talk about. Oh, okay. I, I said I didn't want to talk about the property provider API. Do you want to mention the value of that extension we had? Well, you said it, right? It's the laziness aspect. So when you yeah. wire the input of the task from the extension, the fact that you use property means that you're not evaluating whatever is in the extension at that point. The real evaluation was happening inside the task action of the task. And so when the task runs at that time, the property chain will be resolved in order to look at the value. And so that the, the one of the main reasons for that new API in Gradle is that it breaks out of the pattern of evaluation ordering that the first version of Gradle were suffering from, where effectively you had to pay attention that everything happened in the right order. And now with the laziness chains, you, you, that's no longer an issue. So the, the plugin create, created the extension and created the task. The input of the task came from the extension, but the user hasn't set the value yeah, yet. Yeah, exactly. So when it's time, and then in the build script, the user set a value, but not until the later when the task actually executes, then it resolved it. So it's laziness. Yes, thank you. The demo you just showed yep. was rather trivial, just copying files. Of course. Uh, absolutely, uh, two. Um, so the way I learned Gradle is I wrote a compiler plugin for the Gosu language, the, which I worked on ten years ago, and I mean that's that was serious, right? Um, very heavy compilation tasks. You need to pay attention to caching. So you could, if you worked on a, a JVM language or any language, um, LinkedIn created their own plugin to build Python projects, right? So you could write that. Maybe a, a better example that m we would more likely encounter in our day-to-day -day jobs would be a code generator, right? Um, this is something that's really difficult to get right, uh, and using these test fixtures to assert that, you know, hey, I have a, some schema file, and from that I want to generate Java sources, or straight to bytecode, or something like that. That's a use case where you could assert that your, your plugin and its tasks do, do what you expect. On my side, I've got a plugin that looks at the logging ecosystem and makes sure to fail at build time if you've got competing loggers. Mm. And so, for example, that's a plugin that does not define any task. So it's just about an extension. So unit tests would be just making sure the extension is present. And then after that, all my integration tests are actually resolving dependencies configuration and asserting that the result of the dependency configuration either matches what we expect or fails because you have competing loggers in there. And so that, that's really yeah, extending on that model. OK, these next two slides will be pretty quick review. We talked about this. So there's two ways to check your plugins and tasks, unit tests and functional tests. Unit tests use the project builder. You only are able to check the interactions of applying your plugin to a project. So you can't invoke tasks. You can't resolve configurations. Right. Configurations are when you say, I've got, I want this dependency, this dependency, now show me, go resolve the graph and get all their dependencies and, and so forth. You can't do that in a unit test. Integration or functional tests, you'll be using Gradle Test Kit. This is applied as part of our, um, our plugin authoring plugins we talked about, and the Gradle Runner is the key component of the test kit. So not much else to, to say. Um, some future things we'd like to enable in our, in our testing. 
uh, we'd like to enable support for testing against multiple Gradle API versions. Um, one, one pitfall a lot of community plugin authors sometimes find themselves in is maybe they have a code generator and they write code with Gradle 4 or Gradle 5 to satisfy that requirements, but just like any other library, we try and evolve our APIs over time. And so a plugin that hasn't been updated for several years might have problems running with the latest version of Gradle if it's skipped more than two major versions. So uh, we'd like to do a better job of when you write a plugin, providing you the flexibility to check its backwards compatibility. And I also want to talk a little bit about there are ways today where you can do this, but it's not something we necessarily provide. <clears throat> so the example code snippet we're looking at here, this is in a, a build script, a Kotlin build script, for this list of Gradle API versions, you know, Gradle version 5, 6, 7, and 7.4.2, we're creating a custom test task for each one of these but then we're wiring it to the normal test sources. So that, that trivial test we looked at, we could go run it with the Gradle runner and assert that it works on each of these API versions. There, there's a special system property we create. I don't know if my mouse shows up. Yeah, it does. Tested Gradle version. This is one way of accomplishing this. We don't have a, a official way. So one thing you can do is supply a, a, a magic system property or a special, you know, you name it whatever you want, um, to your test. And then the Gradle runner has an API called with Gradle version, and then you supply this value. And so even though you might be building your code with Gradle 7, you can go back and check it against Gradle 5. Another way you could do this is you could have like an iterable of values in like some test fixture. You don't have to create a bunch of extra tasks like this. You could also have a, a test fixture where you say, list of Gradle versions I want to test, provide the same values. And then depending on what test framework you use, you could iterate over that. Personally, I like to use Spock, uh, not Kotlin test. Uh, and Spock gives you a really nice um, way to do data-driven testing, where you say, given this, the values, take this test method, and iterate over that. Finally, I know there's two community plugins that help you do uh, testing of your Gradle extensions and Gradle plugins against multiple API versions. If you look at the community plugin portal, uh, you'll be able to find a couple uh, examples there. And the reason we mentioned this at this point is also because, you know, in the testing evolution and especially the test suites, we've evoked the possibility of like testing multiple Java version. And so it would make sense that with the cost, like the, the dedicated Gradle plugins for supporting plugin development, it also would be one dimension that we could add, add to the um, test suite features of plugin testing that instead of having a variation on the Java version, you could have a variation on the Gradle version. Um, or potentially combine both. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next chapter, any questions about plugin authoring or testing? Okay, thank you. Okay. So, wh what Kyle showed is effectively how you do your own custom logic. Um, but, um, if I compare that to classical software development, we've told you what classes are, what objects are, um, but we haven't discussed how you actually should organize them so that they make sense and leverage some of the Gradle features. And so the first question is that when you have a given build, you usually have one or more projects. Very few uh, Gradle builds out there have a single project unless they're like a very dedicated, very specific Java library. JVM library, I would say, or even outside of the JVM ecosystem. But more often, you have multiple components to your, prod, to your build. And so what you do is, in the settings, you would be declaring all of these. So you include a number of projects so that your settings is effectively the central piece of information that knows what your build is composed of. And then it can also be used for configuring com common elements. Um, one of the common elements that we showed earlier on were the uh, version catalog 
where you've seen that the declaration of the catalog, like the micronode example I showed, is actually done in settings because that allows the catalog to be visible in all the projects. Um, and Gradle always provides you with that projects task, which can be run on the root project and will give you a list of all the projects that are known to a build. Then, the, re the, I mean, the approach is that you should handle your build structure like any piece of code. Don't repeat yourself, try to build abstractions, um, and effectively apply good development practices. Um, one of the things, though, that we've kind of evolved a little bit is like initial Gradle version had these very convenient all projects or sub projects blocks that allows you from a given project to configure either the entirety of your build or all the sub projects in the hierarchy. Um, we're kind of backtracking from that for different reasons, performance being one of them, and we'll touch on that um, in the last chapter. Uh, but also, actually, we've realized that readability suffers. Like you go somewhere, you open the build file, and the build file just has nothing. And then you have no idea what it is. If you're new to the project, you don't know if it's one of the REST endpoints, it's I if it's one of the support libraries, if it's actually potentially the main entry point of your application, it's just completely opaque. And so now the recommendation are is that effectively think about your future self. When you open the project, you should be able to follow what that project is. And there might be some redundancy in the declaration of the plugins applied, but the plugins applied are effectively what qualify what your project is. And so if you centralize that too much, well, you may end up having some readability issue and all of that. And so, again, I think the easiest is to see code to, to understand some of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk across a multi-project build and, and see kind of best practices for making sure that it's organized the, the proper way. So that's just my wrapper the properties. I'm using the latest Gradle 751. The first thing I can look at is the settings file. And, wait, that's the wrong settings. Hop. I need to look at the settings of the project itself. Fin, of the main build, I would say. So here I can see that I'm first thing I'm doing is I'm naming my project. As you can see, this is an amazing name that could take really long, long time to come up with. Um, and what I can see is that my project itself, for my build, has three projects. So I've got app, list, and utilities. Um, these names are actually what would be generated if you use Gradle init um, to generate an application that has multiple projects. So it's effectively kind of our demo uh, setup, which can be used as a, as a starting point. But now what's interesting is that if I go into, for example, my utilities project and looks at the build script, I will see that I'm using an org example Java library conventions plugin. So first of all, the name. Java library should already give you an indication. So again, I use a clear name to convey my intentions. Um, but then in terms of build configuration, that's pretty much it. The rest is, oh, this utilities is actually using the list project as a dependency. If I go to the list project, I've got similar thing, except that I don't even have a, um, a dependency because that's kind of one of my leave projects. I don't have any external dependencies, and so that's pretty much everything I need to know. Excuse me. That should be better. So one thing I can check <coughs> is, and that's slightly unfortunate in terms of development experience, is that I can't really, you know, come and click through the implementation of that guy. However, what I can do is select the name of the plugin and by using the like full search, find the um, search everywhere search in IntelliJ, everywhere. like the shift shift, depending on your keyboard mapping, but it will actually realize that the only thing that it finds named like that is a gradle.kts file in one of these build logic source main Kotlin plugins. So I'm effectively using a um, script, a convention script plugin. And sorry. <coughs> and so here, if I open that plugin, I can see that it's a build script. So 
no surprise in the syntax, and the only thing it does is again applying plugin. And the plugins it applies is Java library, so that's a classical Gradle plugin, and also a common conventions. And so once again, I can navigate to that guy and realize that obviously we're using Java pretty much overall. Um, we consume our dependencies from Maven Central. We've decided that Java 17 is going to be um, our um, Java version to use and build things. <coughs> For some reason, we have a constraint on commands text. We want it to be 1.9. Maybe that's because, and again, it could be a, a rich dependency declaration so that it's actually a strict version. There is a short notation for that with a double bang. Um, because maybe somebody in the company realized that we have either a dependence on a very specific behavior or a problem with some security issues that were introduced before or after. And then, <coughs> We configure the test suites because we want to use JUnit Jupyter, but we actually need version 5.8.1. And so the thing is, as we've seen, this is applied in my Java library convention, and we've seen that both list and utilities were applying the plugin. So I've effectively extracted most of the configuration of my project, and yes, it's true that then their build script becomes like pretty thin, but the good news is, I've got indications, right? This is obviously a Java library, um, and I can go look into what are my, op my, my opinions for doing Java libraries. And there, the, there's a trail of breadcrumbs to follow to understand where the conventions are. Yeah. In previous Gradle APIs, like all projects, sub-projects you mentioned, you have to just go hunting. It wasn't, wasn't obvious. Yeah. If I now go look at my third project in this multi-project, which is my app project, this time I see that I'm actually applying a different convention, which is the Java application convention. And then again, I've got dependencies and then things that are specific to my application. And if I had multiple application endpoints, clearly the main class is not something that I would set as a convention because this is clearly something that's specific to this project. And so again, if I go here, um, I can open um, this plugin we see that we keep inheriting the Java common conventions and we just add the application plugin. So here we manage to extract everything outside. So now you may have noticed that I'm using this build logic thingy that I did not really discuss so far because I've talked about app list and utilities. And if I go back to my settings.gradle, I kind of skipped over this section. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually leveraging a Gradle feature that we called uh, composite builds, where I'm saying that for my plugin management, so the plugins of my build, I'm actually using another Gradle build that I include. And that Gradle build, it has a relative path. So it's actually checked in next to my project, um, but it's just that this is where build logic gets modified. And so as a software engineer working on delivering features, maybe I will never look inside that folder. But when I, do, when I need to do work on the build logic itself, that's where I would go in order to um, do changes, um, adapt to some things, um, and all of that. And the reason we're using an included build is because it gives us um, an, um, like a few benefits. So first of all, because it's an included build, it has its own settings. So that's a bit of a trick compared to what we said earlier. We said that normally a single repo, a single settings, well, unless you actually want to split the builds apart. What could happen is that as somebody working purely on build logic, I may want to just import that project in the ID. And with all the testing that um, Kyle mentioned earlier, I could have proper tests for all of these projects. And so here we see that we have that AppLogic project. And so that's where I can find my, uh oh, sorry. And we, we see that we have two things. We have regular build logic has its own um, source main Kotlin. So, it, so first of all, it has its settings, but it also has its own build.gradle. I'm applying the Kotlin DSL plugin. Again, back to what Kyle was explaining. That means I'm going to use the Kotlin language or 
uh, pre-compiled Kotlin script to define uh, my build logic, and it, it can fetch external plugins from the Gradle plugin portal. So that's a bit of a setup. And then I can see that I've got the different convention plugins here. One thing I've done is that I also have that app logic. And so the reason is because I could decide that my application convention actually moves elsewhere. And so that one is actually not needed then. And so with these changes, if I run my build, first of all, everything should work. Let's just see. By doing help, I force Gradle to evaluate my project, but effectively do not run any task. The only thing I want is the, the help output of Gradle, but I'm still in the context of a project, so Gradle still has to check if there is anything to add to help, because uh, again, it's a programming model. I would not do that, but you could decide to modify the behavior of help by adding some behavior to it. So, and I can see that I get a successful build. So it means everything is found. Now, what happens? Um, let's say that, um, so first of all, if I rerun help, it goes much faster. And previously, the output was 20 tasks executed, one up to date. And I've moved to one executed, 20 up to date. So I'm now at least showing that aside from help, the rest seems to be well behaved in terms of um, efficiency. When I add um, this application convention as part of a separate project, and I consume it only in my app build script, it means that effectively I'm isolating the relationship between that project and its plugins. And so when Gradle has to reconfigure my build, um, I can do things like if I were to change, for example, in the common convention, and I decide in the end that everything's going to use 18, I'm again reconfiguring a lot of stuff. And I'm again getting kind of different kinds of results. That's because all of these executed tasks, they're not my project task, like they're not the compilation or the running of tests of my application, they're actually the task that I need to run in my build logic. And so because I changed the common convention, I kind of changed a lot of them because by changing common convention and by having application convention being dependent of common convention, I effectively pretty much regenerated my whole build logic, which has the impact of changing potentially the whole behavior of the different projects that I'm using. But because I isolated that, if I do something here, like for example, go back and you know, change that to be, this is actually gonna be 19. Like I have 18 internal libraries, but just the application itself is gonna be 19. This should only affect the one project that applies the plugin. Oh. Cannot access Java, it's internal. What? Oh, it imported the. <laughs> uh, you, you tried too much, IntelliJ. So IntelliJ saw that my other thingy had a generated Kotlin accessor, and it thought, oh, I'm, I need to be smart, and I need to show you that it's the same thing, but it's not. And so again, here, it's, it's red because I would need to um, reimport my Gradle. It messed up. So, but by isolating the application convention plugin, only plugins applying this plugin were affected. O only projects, changed. yes. Only projects applying yes. this plugin were affected by its change. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of another step in the whole um, organizing your build structure is that when you do change build logic, um, and you've got really large projects, you may want to make sure that your changes impact as little as possible um, the, the, the development projects so that whenever you roll out these changes, the impact on configuration and rerunning tasks, because one of the consequences is that since this changed, then the, 
the class path of my project implicitly changes, and so a lot of things get invalidated because the class path of my project is part of a number of inputs for different tasks. So that's kind of it, a bit showing quickly and, and navigating through the different pieces of a well-structured Gradle project. And so what we've seen is we've got all these different projects with some form of relationship between them through dependencies, right? I, I didn't insist on that, but app actually depends on utilities and is the one using that external commons text library without a version because I have a convention to actually set the version through a constraint. Um, and then at the same time, leveraging these um, convention plugins to make sure that I share as much of the bit logic as I can and not have to repeat myself. Mm. Does that make sense? Or is there any question? Should be a better. Mm -hmm. Yes? The, so the, the question, question is, is, does it make sense to do it when you have very similar projects or, or where you have not? If you have very similar sub-projects, yes, I think it makes sense because otherwise, um, I mean, the net effect is what? Let me go back to my app logic. Let me get rid of that. So I only have effectively a single Java version everywhere, which is the one I get from my Java convention. Um, I need to change the, the language, like we, we decide to bump the Java version from 18 to 19. Th that's the only change my build author needs to do. Yeah. Yes, and so what you were doing is effectively, let's go back, that's what we were discussing. It's like, it's like extracting code to a separate method so you can reuse it. Um. Each of these projects would need to apply your convention plugin. So there is still that sort of level of repetition, but the implementation details are centralized in one place. So I could add a root build script next to the settings of my project, and I could do that. And that's going to work, I mean, like <sighs> That's going to work assuming that all of these projects have properly applied the Java plugin. So like there will be tricks in evaluation order, mm -hmm. but the main aspect is if I don't have that and I navigate from my list project, if I go look at the, like either the list project even doesn't have a convention, then how do I know? What is list? And so that's what I was um, mentioning before showing the demo is really about having the information available. And so yes, there is some form of duplication because you have to repeat, like as you can see, there is repetition between um, list and utilities, like they both apply the same plugin, but at least it qualifies what we're doing. And of course here I'm showing it to you with like three projects, right? Um, but if you've got like dozens or hundreds of them, hundreds. God forbid thousands, because that exists out there, mm -hmm. then this is, I think this is a better pattern because you have the ability to follow the chain of configuration and to understand exactly what your project is doing and how it's configured. Of course, it's less important for the software engineer, but for the bill author, it might be critical. Yes? Good. Okay, also, thumbs up. We, you know, we have partnerships um, with a lot of other companies in our ecosystem, including JetBrains, who makes IntelliJ, also Microsoft, we're working together on Visual Studio Code. So the ability to say, click on this plugin name and go to the definition that was missing today, we had to search for it by name, yeah. but we were always looking at, you know, partnering to make those kind of improvements yeah. for a better experience. Yes. Yes. So the question is, uh, what's the semantic? If I have a project that slightly differs from the convention, can I overwrite what the plugin was doing? And the answer is yes. So th 
that's the whole that's the whole thing, and that's why also um, we're looking at properties over evaluation order. It's because effectively, if I take that block and go to utilities and paste it here, then this is like literally. Um, Ah, crap, utilities depends on list. So let's assume it has no dependency. But that one I decide needs to be 11 for some reason. Yeah, th this one wins. No, you have to think all everything we do in Gradle is a configuration execution on an object. So if I were to do uh, well, I, I can actually show it like that. Uh, what is it again? If I were to do something like that, as you can see, I'm not writing it in a single block. I'm writing it in two blocks. But the spec I'm changing is the same. So this second invocation, no, that's, I don't want the, this second invocation does not undo the first invocation. It adds to it, so it's additive. It's an additive change. And so the fact that in my other file, I go and select 11, I'm just changing the language version, so the vendor still is set. Yes. It's, it's, the, it's calling a, a different method of the same object, uh, but that doesn't affect the state of the Yeah. Now, to be very object. clear, this is, a f uh, this is the way the DSL is designed. As a plugin author, you could decide that your DSL, like, every time changes the thing, but then you have to be really clear because for some, like, you're effectively hurting composition. And so you have to have a strong argument for hurting that composition. But otherwise, the whole point is to effectively be able to compose. OK. Sorry, computer went to sleep. I hope that's not the case of too many of you. <laughs> so as we discussed, have convention plugins, because that's really helping for having defaults and everything. And I showed them inside the project, but they could be published. We had a historical convention, which is build source, which is a way of putting all of your plugins um, in a single location, has a little bit less setup. The main downside is some of the effects I showed you of mutating some convention and not impacting the whole project. Um, are lost with build source because effectively build source gets placed to every project's class path, so any change to it invalidates every project. I mentioned the composites, so that's what we're doing when we're including a build. Um, I've shown the including of a build in the context of build logic, but you can actually, in a larger organization that has things like microservices, you could create an Uber build of a number of microservices that you include build in each other, and suddenly you would get cross repositories refactoring possibilities. Because from the Gradle's point of view, it all becomes a single project with all the path properly represented. And then the IDE knows that when you change that contract, it has to change the consumer of the contract. So composite build is really something interesting, um, even if you're um, not looking at build logic, but just looking at a regular composition. Um, and then we have the build logic in composites. That's exactly what I showed. Um, and so that means we effectively done that demo. So if I go to a question that we get asked often, um, monorepo versus multi-repository. Well, the answer is Gradle doesn't care. It's really up to you. You can have a single repository with multiple Gradle builds and then entry points for the developers based on, based on their team. Oh, you're in that team, so you, your entry point is here, and it's going to do a composite of that build and that build because that's where you're going to work most of the time. Um, you can have the opposite, which is, oh, we will go multi-repo, but again, we will still have some composites to, do, to assemble builds whenever it makes sense um, for some tasks. Um, 
And so it's really up to you. That's really a choice which is yours. Let's not hide it. There are a few things that work in a single build that do not fully work in composites, but that's something we're trying to close that gap by every release, um, trying to reduce these differences. Was that something around the structure that made sense? And are there any questions left on that topic before we jump onto performance? Okay, Kyle? Yep. Go ahead. Okay, thank you everyone. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna rip through performance. It probably deserves a lot more time than we have, but uh, everyone knows this XKCD, right? I mean, we'll be fast for performance. It's good, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> I can do the performance <laughs> chapter quickly because we have no performance issues at all. Um, everyone knows the classic, you know, compilation takes too long, developers are going to screw around. But I think there's another side to this also, which is about staying in flow, staying in focus, right? You're, everyone knows you have that magical hour or two, maybe more, of the day where the kids are at school and everything's quiet and you can finally focus. Having a long build or something that disrupts your workflow is, is bad, for, bad for productivity. You get distracted, get out of your flow. So at Gradle, we want to for pro, we want to help the productivity by uh, I, we, I, w I don't want to use a relative term like fast. We want to make your build fast. We want to we want to make it as rapid as possible, right? Um, that means less time waiting, fewer instances of context switching, right? Um, if you know your build is going to take three minutes, five minutes, an hour, you're gonna you know you're gonna multitask and go do something else, but it takes you out of the flow, out of the zone. So what we strongly encourage, if you're, if you're ready to go down this journey of optimizing your software assembly and delivery process, right, is think about the science, not developer sentiment. Developers, me included, are very cranky and will always complain, ah, oh, the build is so slow, right? Well, like, let's, you know, if this is something you're interested in taking on, we encourage you to, to measure and measure first, right? Make changes, gather the results, and you know, take a scientific approach to things. A um, couple other hints from my personal experience is be careful of traps like what have you done for me lately? I can think of a, a build that I made go from like 37 minutes down to five. And my boss said, you know, that's nice, but anything over two minutes, I expect engineers to multitask and do something else anyway. And I'm thinking that's a 5x improvement and you just you know, poo-pooed it, but whatever. Um, also, think about um, using your CI environment to measure your improvements to your build process because if, you're, if you have engineers like me, might have uh, hundreds of browser tabs open, um, probably three of which playing YouTube in the background, I don't even realize it, 12 IntelliJ projects and whatever else going on. The local environment can be very inconsistent. So assuming your CI is more even, um, trusted improvements you measure and make there will trickle down to the local environments. Um, Louis mentioned Gradle build scans earlier. I want to just click on one just briefly to show you what, uh, show you what one looks like. Two kind of cool things we can click through is, is the timeline here. So this is a record of which tasks ran we see at what timestamp relative to the start of the build did they execute and what was their duration. So that's a cool area you can check out. Also dependencies, let's hope this build resolved any dependencies and it did not. <laughs> um, the, the, this is a very useful tool for troubleshooting. You've probably all been in dependency hell at some point or the other where you know I asked for Guava 12 and I got 23 and shame on you for having Guava in your class path in the first place. But uh, this is very useful for troubleshooting those types of issues. And go. Okay. Uh, we have another tool called Gradle Profiler. Uh, you can download it, build it from source yourself from this GitHub URL. I think it's also available in Homebrew and there's some other instructions you can access it. Um, this, this fills in some gaps that build scans can't provide you. For example, CPU and memory profiling. So you have something that's using a lot of CPU, like BuildScan won't offer that, but this will allow you to uh, devise a scenario. Uh, it also gives you the ability to like do warm-up iterations, 
execute your scenario multiple times, you know, throw out the high and the low, do statistical analysis on uh, the benchmarking process. Uh, a couple other real quick areas. I don't have a lot of time to go deeply into these, but uh, building in parallel and managing memory. Um, I'll just, for the sake of time, leave you with, we have a flag called dash dash parallel. It is not enabled by default. So you, you, you can turn it on and it should improve performance of your build. Just be careful if your build is extremely well tuned. Um, parallelism can actually slow down your local machine. Um, most builds probably aren't to this point, but it can happen. Uh, a quick note about memory management. Um, I mentioned before uh, when we were talking about the Gradle Runner that there's a third JVM that's created. There's actually four. Um, when you launch the Gradle client from the command line, it creates a very small, just a 64 megabyte uh, VM. We call this the launcher the client. This goes and then spawns a daemon. That's your persistent process. Uh, usually you would configure the memory properties of the daemon in the gradle.properties file. Um, but some tasks, like for example Scala, uh, the Scala compilation task, it itself forks off into a third process, kind of like testing, or the testing VM is another example. You, certain tasks need to have their memory configured independently. So this is a common pitfall when developers are seeing like, um, you know, out of, out of space or out of heap error or out of memory exception. Um, these are some places you can look. It may not be in the Gradle daemon. It may be that like a Scala compiler is running in a separate process and it needs additional heap. The check style task we recently improved in, I think, 7.5 to yeah. also have its own heap um, settable individually. Uh, I'm going to bypass this, uh, but this is just some things we talked about using the Gradle Profiler. Uh, I mentioned a couple different places where we can uh, set memory settings. I'm going to rip through this. Um, it'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't mention the configuration cache. I want to leave you with this note. I'm sorry we won't have time to demo it, but um, when Louis showed the help task on his last demo, you know, he ran it. Um, he ran it again, and it was very quick. It said only uh, 20 tasks up to date, one executed, right? Um, not only were we not invoking tasks unnecessarily, if you don't change anything in your build logic, right, why does Gradle need to reprocess that configuration? And so the configuration cache, this feature we're working on, is all about persisting that state, and when as soon as you invoke Gradle, skipping the configuration phase, which is figure out what to do, and jumping straight to the execution phase, which is actually do the work. So um, I want to just leave you with, um, here's an example of a couple builds that have enabled the new configuration cache feature. The help task went from 8 seconds to 0 0.5. I think this is a mock repo we use with 500 subprojects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then looking at the running the assemble task, which compiles all the production sources, went from 40 seconds down to 13. So that tells you that the the compilation part of the build, um, only 13 seconds was Java C. The rest of it was us figuring out what's the actual work you need to do. So sorry, I don't have time to demo, but um, the there are some constraints uh, you'll have to look through later. But the, the message I want to leave you with is... Um, the, it's not simple. You can't just turn it on. Um, you, the Gradle build needs to understand sort of external inputs to the configuration of the project, of the build, and you'll have to do some adaptation to isolate things. But if your build becomes configuration cache compatible, you've now isolated yourself from external factors. You enforce best practices in defining inputs and outputs. And there could be a little bit of short-term pain if you look at this feature, uh, but there's a huge long-term gain in productivity and an instant payoff. Once you get it working, it's not you don't have to wait weeks or months for it to pay off. It, it's instant. So uh, I'd strongly encourage you to look at this. Wish we had more time to talk more about the details. Yeah, Should have done but it's super break. cool. I will say, if any of you are, are Android developers here, just curious, do you guys use this? Okay, you need to. It's it's awesome. Um, I can say specifically the way Android and AGP is very complex. 
applies lots of tasks and configurations to your build, uh, definitely check this out. This is um, really cool things happening with Android development and the configuration cache. And any other Java project, right, you can take advantage of this as well. Okay, Louis, you want to take us home with the, the roadmap? We have one minute. Yeah, I so left you plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have now um, a GitHub project that shows the public roadmap for Gradle. So if you're interested, have a look. Um, you can't really comment on these issues, but there are links towards the uh, regular issue tracker. So if you have questions, comments, um, that's a, a good way of, of working with that. Um, now, I'll just put that one up. Questions effectively, thank you for your time. We have maybe time's up. So <laughs> come see us, right? And talk to um, us. Yeah. yeah, talk to us. Like, we'll both be here until tomorrow, end of the day, and I'm here the whole week. So just bump into me, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, one more, yep. There we go. Yep, we have a Developer Productivity Engineering Summit in San Francisco, where I live, next month. Uh, if anyone's going to be in the States, come say hi. I'll be there. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.